Good morning. Please be seated. It is January 4th, 2022. Um, good morning again to you all. The panel is prepared this morning to hear the party's arguments about their proposed redistricting plans. As we noted in our orders of December 15th and December 28th, uh, face coverings are required uh, throughout the course of this hearing, and it looks like everyone um, has a face covering provided. Given the public's strong interest in this once every decade proceeding, uh, we will permit counsel who are presenting argument to remove their face covering if they feel that would help them communicate more effectively. Please be mindful of the time and state your name and the parties you represent when you begin your presentation. With that, counsel for the Watson plaintiffs, and I don't remember. There you go. All right, you may proceed. By way of reminder, you will need to hit the microphone button so it turns green, but you can leave it sitting there. But just hit the button so it's green. Thank you, Your Honors. May it please the court, counsel. Uh, my name is Adam Sinkowski, and with me is uh, Jody Nolofsky and James Gilbert. And we represent the plaintiffs, Peter Watson, Joseph Mansky, Nancy Greenwood, Mary Cupper, Douglas Backstrom, James Hugas III, and League of Women Voters, Minnesota. The Watson plaintiffs' redistricting plans were drawn by Minnesotans for Minnesotans. While Peter Watson uh, was in involved in drafting these plans, uh, who is a lifetime public servant, um, working for the Minnesota Senate, so is Joseph Mansky, who uh, has worked in elections for 32 years in this state, including state election director. But it's also important to remember that the League of Women Voters Minnesota also had input and assisted us in drawing these maps. The Watson plaintiff's approach to map drawing was relatively straightforward. We tried to create urban core districts, and in those urban cores, you create as few districts as possible, and then create districts around that urban core that are receiving the growing population from that area. We tried to unite minority communities where we thought that it made sense on the ground. And where possible, we attempted not to cross major geographic boundaries such as rivers and follow transportation corridors. As we go through our plans today, uh, one thing that will become apparent is that Watson plaintiffs were focused less on statistics and more on what makes sense on the ground for the peoples and the communities in this state. So my plan today is to spend most of my time on our legislative plan. It's 201 districts as compared to the eight for the congressional. And we just feel it um, requires a little more attention um, to, to fully understand it. So I'm going to start in Minneapolis-St. Paul, move out to greater Minnesota, and then move into the Twin Cities metro area. Uh, and, and as you go through our plans today, uh, you will notice that there are some maps that may not look like the ones that were filed in this case. And while that may be the case, these maps are used the census data, block data in this case. They use the block files provided by the parties, and they are the exact same maps, but they provide more detail so that this, that this panel can uh, fully understand what's going on on the ground. Before we get to that, I just want to talk about one set of data, and that is minority opportunity districts in this state. And the reason I put this on the screen, because this minority um, opportunities for minorities to elect candidates of their choice uh, drove decisions by the parties in this case, and rightfully so. But I want to point this out because while the Watson plaintiffs, specifically in their house plan, may have less uh, opportunity districts than the Anderson plaintiffs, and or more than the Anderson plaintiffs and less than the Saxon Corey, we felt we struck the right balance in uniting communities in a way that made sense. So starting in Minneapolis and St. Paul, I start here because I feel like this really illustrates the attention to detail that the Watson plaintiffs um, had in creating their maps. The charts on this map 
uh, are charts of minority voting age population by precinct. This is all part of the census data. This is drawn from the census data. Um, and what these charts show is that in the Watson Plain of 62A, they created a district that encompasses the Cedar Riverside community. We made effort to keep this community together. And if you look just to the east of that, you'll see that the minority community ends. And that's the University of Minnesota West Bank campus. And across the bank is the East Bank campus with a larger Asian population. And then if you notice, our 62B to the south has a larger Hispanic population. Now, and I, I point that out because as I look at the other parties' maps, while they may have an extra Senate opportunity district in 60B, which, where the Watson plaintiffs do not have an opportunity district here, they divided those communities. Uh, the Anderson plaintiffs uh, pulled in part of that Riverside community into their House District 60B. And they divided part of that Riverside community into the Southeastern District. Similarly, the Sachs plaintiffs actually compared to everyone else, they have 11 house opportunity districts in the Metro uh, Twin City, not the Metro, but the Twin City St. Paul area. But to achieve this, if you look at their 60B on the north side of the river, they had to slice off a piece of the Asian population and move it down to 63A, and then they had to take a part of the Riverside community on the other side of the river and move that into 63A to create an opportunity district of 31.2%. So while they have, they can say they have more opportunity districts than we do, the Watson plaintiffs really tried to keep these communities together. And our plan used this attention to detail throughout the entire state. And the Cory plaintiffs similarly um, have, um, did leave part of that Riverside community outside into 62A and pulled part of the Riverside community into the West Bank University of Minnesota campus. I just must ask, where's my time located? Oh, there it is, thank you. Um, so moving out to greater Minnesota now. I'm gonna start in Rochester. Um, Rochester is a city with 120,000 people, so it can have two dominant Senate Rochester districts. Um, the parties took similar but different approaches. Some of the parties divided Rochester exactly in half. And what that resulted in generally was two House districts of 40,000 people and two House districts with 40,000 Rochester residents and two House districts with 20,000 Rochester residents. What the Watson plaintiffs did is we divided Rochester 76,000 people in one Senate district and 44,000 people in another. And the reason for this is by doing it this way, there are three dominant Rochester House districts where Rochester is assured of having three House members represent them. In the way that the, and just this is the way the HIPAA panel um, did the, the first approach of going 40, 40, 20, 20 in their House districts. But those two 20,000 person Rochester House districts may not be represented by a Rochester representative because the rural vote may decide who is representing those individuals. So we thought it was better to have the three dominant Rochester House districts as opposed to two dominant and two half and half. Uh, the Anderson plaintiffs uh, followed the Hippert approach of two dominant Rochester House districts and two of 20,000 each. Uh, I'll also note that the Anderson plaintiffs took their Rochester districts into Winona County, up into Wabasha County, and even up into Goodhue County. Um, the Watson plaintiffs, only Rochester districts include only Olmstead County and then Eastern Dodge County. Um, and in, this actually required quite a few political subdivision splits too to, to, to make this work, uh, to create districts like this. And they, didn't, and they also omitted Eastern Olmstead County or Western Olmstead County from the Rochester district, despite the fact that it's really right outside of that city. And the Sachs plaintiffs, they took a, a similar approach to the, the Watson plaintiffs. Um, they kind of went in between our approach of 40-40, of 20-20, and then three house districts that were um, the same. And then the Cory plaintiffs, uh, this is another one of our maps showing the, um, the minority voting, op uh, voting population voting age population. And this is where they created one of those, you know, as I said, they had three extra minority opportunity house districts. This is where they created one of those in 28B. And this, um, what this does is you, if you look in South 
East Rochester, you'll see that there's a little pocket there of District 27A that's kind of off by itself in the city. And if you look in Northeast Rochester, that 27A is kind of separated um, from the other part of their 27A on the northwest side of the city. So while I, you know, I think their intentions are good, um, sometimes creating an opportunity district can actually divide communities. Uh, moving on to St. Cloud, um, the Hippert panel and the Watson, Sachs, and Corey plaintiffs all included St. Cloud into one Senate district. Uh, St. Cloud has a population of approximately 69,000 people, so consistent with our approach of creating an urbanized, an urban district surrounded by districts that are receiving the growing population, we put St. Cloud in one Senate district. This is how St. Cloud sits today under the Hippert panel's um, map. And then north of St. Cloud, we did choose to split Benton County. Uh, but what this did is this united the northern suburbs of Sauk Rapids and Sartell, which almost have enough population to create their own separate house district. So while this resulted in a split, this created a convenient district that we thought made sense on the ground. Again, this is very, very, very similar to what the HIPPER panel did. Now, if we move on to the Anderson plaintiffs, they split St. Cloud in half. And you know, I think the parties talked about this in their briefs, but the reality of this decision is that instead of having one competitive district and one safe Republican district, St. Cloud now has two strong Republican districts under this, this plan. Um, they also pulled in Northeast Benton County, uh, and, which, is, which is rural vote. And they also um, split Sauk Rapids and Sartell. And while they may have preserved a political subdivision, they cr created what we feel is an inconvenient district uh, by dividing these two north suburban communities. I think the Sachs plaintiffs took a, a, a relatively similar pro approach to the Watson plaintiffs of uniting St. Cloud uh, and uniting Sauk Rapids and Sartell. And for the Corey plaintiffs, this is, this is another area where they uh, created an opportunity district. And as you can see from the map on the left, uh, they, they followed the minority community to create this district of 33.7 minority voting age population. And again, while um, this does create that, that district, um, it does divide the, 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 remain, the, the remainder of the St. Cloud City into kind of different you know, regional areas of that, of that community. Um, and, they all, and they also um, split Sauk Rapids into two Senate districts, it looks like, in, in attempting to achieve that. Um, I don't have a ton to say about Moorhead other than that um, the Hipper panel, the Watson plaintiffs, the Sachs plaintiffs, and the Corey plaintiffs took a very similar approach. Uh, they included all of Clay County. Uh, the Watson plaintiffs and Hipper panel went into Norman County, as did the Sachs plaintiffs. The Corey plaintiffs went uh, more into Becker County, but all the, all the parties um, included Detroit Lakes, except for the Anderson plaintiffs, and um, they went all the way down to Stevens County and created a, a very long district. And um, this, this, do, this doesn't have a partisan impact of any kind. It's they're relatively similar. But I think what this is, is, it is a, uh, it's the effect of trying to create these perfect districts where we're focused on statistics and um, creating districts that are um, maybe not split as much, but then you create an inconvenient district. And you can split districts to comply with constitutional requirements. And we think while their 1A may not be split and their 15A may not have any splits, I think it resulted in a district like this uh, in between. And we think constitutionally to create a convenient district that the splits that the Watson plaintiffs made in the rural area, specifically in Northwest Minnesota, were justified under this constitutional convenience factor. And just going on to Duluth, I just put up that up there just to show that uh, the Watson plaintiffs, again, took the approach of creating an urban core district, and then the red area around it is District 2B. So we tried to surround it with one house district, district because that District 2B is experiencing population or experiencing life in the Duluth area in a very similar way. They are receiving the growing population of the city of Duluth. And the same with Mankato. We created a 
Mankato dominant house district, 18B, and we created districts around it that are receiving the growing Mankato population. Uh, we discussed this in our brief a little bit, but I, I do just put this up there to uh, sh show that th the difference in approaches. You know, the Watson plaintiffs were willing to split political subdivisions to comply with constitutional requirements here. And we felt that the 11 people that are left in District 5B under the Anderson plaintiffs plan it's not convenient for them to have representatives in District 5B. They should be represented by the, uh, their, their, um, the, the reservation, the American Indian Reservation of which they are a part of for convenience. And also um, just to, um, for minority representation and so that they can be represented someone that experiences life in a similar way that they do. And again, crossing the Mississippi. This is another area where we have a split but we, had, we knew we had to go down and find a bridge to make District 29A convenient. And while um, District 29A may be perfect, as the Anderson plaintiffs describe it, um, because it doesn't split any counties, it's not a convenient district. And I zoom in on Elk River, because if you go back, you'll notice our Elk River had a very funny looking um, um, shape, uh, the way that we split it. And the reason I zoom in on Elk River um, is because this is a district divided along precinct lines. And by dividing this along precinct lines, while it may look different, if you, it's hard, kind of hard to see on the screen here, but it follows roads. Uh, it follows the, that, that big blank area just to the north in the middle of it, of the, of the boundary, that's a park. And it's, it, it, it looks like the area to the south is more congested and, and uh, is a more congested population, whether it be a, a downtown area or, or a neighborhood. And I point this out because only the people of Elk River know where to draw those lines. Uh, the, 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 the parties to this case do not have the information available to them, and it's just given the nature of this proceeding and trying to draw 201 districts, uh, the Watson plaintiffs felt that it was in the best interest in terms of convenience to use what has been done in four, over 4,000 voting districts in this state. Let's use the work of the people on the ground in drawing our districts for convenience sake, for keeping communities together. And you know, I back and I meant to say this when I was talking about Minneapolis, uh, the Watson plaintiffs did not split any uh, precincts in Minneapolis in their Senate plan. And I think that was shown, or that was the, the positive effect of that was shown in our map where we kept these communities together. Because as we discussed in our brief, Minneapolis has a very, uh, well thought out and very comprehensive process to creating wards in that city. And, and precincts are housed within wards. So by keeping these precincts together in Minneapolis, we kept the communities together that were created by community leaders in this ward redistricting process in that city. And, and so the Watson plaintiffs just feel that, if, like I said, over 4,000 voting districts in this state created by each community in this state, let's, let's use that to our advantage. Uh, moving on to um, American Indian, uh, Native American Indian reservations, uh, the Watson plaintiffs, well, I guess I'll start with the Hippert panel. The Hippert panel uh, included the Red Lake and the White Earth reservations in one Senate district. The Watson plaintiffs uh, put that into one House district and one Senate district. And um, while the Sachs plaintiffs and the Cory plaintiffs uh, did, uh, the Sachs plaintiffs in one Senate district and the Cory plaintiffs in one House district, um, we felt for the sake of convenience that maybe that went a little too far in terms of convenience. Uh, but I will note that when I look at these districts and I look at what the Anderson plaintiffs did, they actually created a division where there was not one under the Hippert plan. They divided that house district that contained the White Earth and the Red Lake reservations into two separate house districts. Uh, talking about the I-35 corridor, Owatonna, Faribault, and Northfield, uh, the Watson plaintiffs attempted to keep that corridor into one Senate district. So under the Watson plaintiffs' plan, Owatonna, Faribault, and Northfield are all included in one Senate district. Uh, I believe the uh, Cory plaintiffs offered affidavit testimony about how there is a large Latino population along this corridor, specifically in Owatonna and Faribault. So, uh, so it makes sense to keep these communities together for numerous reasons, including convenience, 
and also um, maximizing the, op the opportunities of minorities to elect representatives of their choice. And I think the Cory plaintiffs also, um, I know they did, as I look at their districts, they're 25, they're Senate District 25, they also kept this community uh, together. Um, I think the Anderson plaintiffs have it in three or four Senate districts, or three Senate districts. They, they put Owatonna in one Senate district, Faribault in another, and Northfield in another. And the Sachs plaintiffs uh, do the same thing. And then just to finish up on Greater Minnesota, I just want to point out uh, the Albert, the I-90 corridor down in Albert Lee and Austin. Uh, under the Hippert plan, Albert Lee and Austin were in the same Senate district. And under the Watson plan, they are, and I believe it's the Sachs plan, they also are too. And the Anderson plan split those communities, and they also split a county uh, to achieve that. And what that does is eliminates a competitive district uh, where there was one under the Hipper plan, there is no longer, that is no longer a competitive district now. Um, that is a district that uh, leans pretty heavily Republican by splitting those communities up. All right, so now I'm going to move into the Twin Cities metropolitan area. Um, you know, starting in Bloomington, Richfield, Edina, this is the Watson plaintiff's plan. And as you look at Bloomington, Richfield, and Edina, you can see that based on the minority populations, they're very different communities. And um, having lived in Eastern Bloomington for a few years, I'll say they are very different communities. And the Watson plaintiffs kept East Bloomington and Richfield together. They are very similar. And as you can see under the Watson plan is 44B, and I didn't explain this earlier, but those percentages underneath each district, that's the minority voting age population for each party. And that, that'll line up what is in their minority, rep, um, minority representation reports. But if you look at districts four, where 44A and 44B come together, that Senate district, those are very similar communities. They're separated by 494. And just to talk a little bit more about Bloomington, you know, there's the Mall of America, there's the airport, there's all those car dealerships on the fourth, north side of 494, there's all the hotels on the south side of 494 that service the airport. It's, a, it's, a, it's an industrial area, it's a business area, and then there's some housing around it. In western Bloomington, and like Edina, it's very white, suburban. Um, it's a very, very different community. So we felt that the east-west Bloomington divide is what made the most sense. And the Hipper panel also did a east-west Bloomington divide, and as did the Cory plaintiffs. The Sachs plaintiffs did a north-south Bloomington divide, and, um, and they also crossed the river. And I will note, uh, one thing I want to point out, too, um, is where the Sachs plaintiffs, their District 58A, which I think is just a, 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 sh a shade above um, that 30% minority opt opportunity district number. And what you'll look is what they did is they went, they took their 58A, went, went down to 86th Street, they which, and then they went east, and then they went back up and they grabbed a, um, a piece of territory. Um, I don't know if it was to get above that 30% mark, but that was the outcome. And while, so again, while they may have, you know, 24 minority opportunity districts to R21, uh, to achieve that goal, they had to um, create a district that uh, is inconvenient and basically goes around a community and divides a community uh, to achieve that end. And again, you know, and then I also look just to the east of what they of that where they went and grabbed that that um, that large that that precinct with the large minority population. That's to the east of that is still a, a relatively, relative for the area, a relatively large minority population in the city of Bloomington that is now in an entirely different Senate district that are going to be represented more by people like those in West Bloomington and Central Bloomington as opposed to people that are experiencing life in a similar way as they are. So I, I, I point this out because I think it underlies the the difference in approaches that the parties took. The Watson plaintiffs were focused on what makes sense on the ground, not statistical outcomes, not achieving certain benchmarks. Uh, what the Watson plaintiffs did in Bloomington makes sense on the ground. I don't think what the Sachs plaintiffs did does. And then the Anderson plaintiffs, um, 
Again, I think the Anderson plaintiffs approach, I don't see any evidence that they were intentionally diluting a minority vote, but what I do see is an approach that just didn't take it into account. Uh, I look at their putting you know, Southeast, you know, South Richfield and, and Northeast Bloomington to put those in separate Senate districts to divide those communities um, just doesn't make a lot of sense. And to pair Richfield with Edina, while they may border each other, they're very different communities. And the same with East Bloomington and West Bloomington. While they may only have one Senate political subdivision split in Bloomington, uh, they have paired two areas that are just quite frankly very different from one. Then moving south of the river, um, I think this is an example, I, I point this out because this is an example of an area where the Watson plaintiffs have more opportunity districts than the other parties, but show that this was not difficult to achieve and this was difficult by just following the, the geography on the ground. Um, the Watson plaintiffs, uh, Senate District 54 is an opportunity Senate district. And all we had to do to create that was include the whole city of Burnsville, and the north side of Savage. And we were able to keep Apple Valley in one Senate district. We kept Egan in one Senate district. Uh, Prior Lake and Shakopee are in one Senate district. And again, and then the other opportunity, and then we're also the party, only party with three opportunity house districts. I think I just said that. Um, and that, that was created by just following the natural geography on the ground and focusing on what's actually going on in this area. Um, not, don't draw lines to go pick up pockets of population. Let's try to do it in a way that doesn't divide communities. Let's do it in a way that draws communities together. And again, in Shakopee, that is another area with a minority opportunity district. Everyone has a minority opportunity district there. That was, um, I think pretty much everyone kept that prior Lake Shakopee community together. And then moving on to the Sachs plaintiffs, where they um, were, again, they had the Shakopee very similar, but I, I just, I, I note their, um, their de the decision to cross the river in Bloomington and pick up nor uh, nor northern Burnsville and then go, the rest of that Senate district goes way east into Egan and picks up just the central part of that state, dividing Egan into three Senate districts. And again, if you look at the Watson plaintiffs' plan, Egan's not divided into two Senate districts. Apple Valley is not. Prior Lake and Shakopee are not. Burnsville is not. It's just, it wasn't a necessary decision. Um, and I, I, I see lines like this, and it just, it, it, it appears more of dividing rather than uniting communities in this area. Let's see Anderson plan. And then this is the Corey plan. And in talking about the Cory plan, um, I guess my, what I want to just note is their, the line between their District 39B and their District, I think it's 46A in Burnsville, where you can see that they, there are two large minority precincts that they divided from their 46A and between their 39B. And I, I can't say I know the reason for this, but I think what it illustrates is just the attention to detail that we pay to try to not create situations like that where we're dividing communities. And then if you look who they paired those, those divisions with, if you go way to the east into, I think it's Rosemount, I mean, those are not very diverse communities there. So they've paired very, they've, they've taken these two very diverse precincts and they've paired them with very, very non-diverse areas in Rosemount. So while they may go into Burnsville and they may um, interact with these people in Burnsville and these communities that are very much like them, they will not have representation that is um, experiencing life in a similar way that they are. And I don't think I'm, I'm not going to get through all of this, um, but my plan is to just continue in the afternoon to try to get through our whole plan. Um, so uh, moving on to the Southwest Metro, what I, I showed this because I think this illustrates the concept of pairing House and Senate districts and the approaches that the parties took in, in creating those pairings. So if you look at the Watson plaintiffs plan to the left, you see that we've created a Lake Minnetonka uh, district, I think that's 40A, and then we've paired it with the city of Minnetonka 
which is on the lake and then goes just east. This is a district that is a very similar Lake Minnetonka area community. It's a second tier suburb. Now, if you look at what the Sachs plaintiffs did, they went up into Lake Minnetonka and pulled in Wyzetta and Deep Haven and Green Haven and Greenwood and pulled them down into, um, into Minnetonka and then the, the district kind of grows and gets wider into Eden Prairie. And then they take, Minnet they take uh, Minnetonka, which is in the portion of it that's even on Gray's Bay, and they pair that all the way with East St. Louis Park, which is bordering North Minneapolis. Again, the people that live on Gray's Bay are experiencing life in a very different way than the people who live in Northeast St. Louis Park, bordering on North Minneapolis. So this, this also shows the approach of pairing first-tier suburbs with first-tier suburbs second tier suburbs with second tier suburbs and exurbs with exurbs. And, and again, on the Anderson plaintiff's plan on the right, they, while their District 32B, it's a really good looking district, but they've paired it with District 32A, which is a very exurban district that includes Greenfield, Cochrane, and Hanover. And I, I, I just, I don't see how the people of Wyzetta and Greenwood and Deep Haven are experiencing life in a similar way to the people in Hanover, Greenfield, and Cochrane. So I will stop there, and I will pick it up in the Northeast Metro uh, with uh, the rest of our time. Thank you, Council. Thank you. We will next hear from Council for the Anderson plaintiffs. Good morning, may it please the court. My name is Elizabeth Brahma with the Taft Law Firm. I'm here on behalf of the Anderson plaintiffs who are Paul Anderson, Ida Lano, Chuck Brusman, Karen Lane, Joel Hinneman, Carol Wagner, and Daniel Schoenhart. Uh, the Anderson plaintiffs are, are pleased to be presenting their plans here today and will be taking a different approach than what you heard from the Watson plaintiffs a moment ago. Uh, we'll start by talking about some common principles that the Anderson plaintiffs um, used in drawing maps, and then proceed to congressional districts and followed by legislative districts. I anticipate we'll spend most of our time on the overall comparison of the plans and how the pieces fit together. And we'll talk about individual districts as time permits this morning with a little more focus on that this afternoon. So the Anderson plaintiffs' plan focused on First, prioritizing constitutional and statutory requirements. And many of those uh, include issues like population equality and political subdivisions, which are by definition statistical measures. And so that was something that we were able to objectively and carefully measure in developing plans, both congressional and legislative plans, that meet constitutional requirements while also satisfying longstanding um, legal criteria, uh, United States Supreme Court uh, directives about redistricting, particularly when conducted by courts, and also past panels' uh, determinations. The primary issue, of course, in redistricting is population deviation. One person, one vote is, is the foundation of court-mandated uh, redistricting. And the courts, of course, have to adhere to an even higher standard than legislatures and, and state governors when they enact redistricting plans. And so we uh, were very uh, cognizant of that and in the congressional plan achieved ideal population um, for each of the uh, congressional districts with one, a one-person differential where necessary and achieved de minimis population deviation with our legislative plans. These are foundational principles, and so we needed, felt it was important to point that out because um, it just, it, without that, there's, there's nothing else uh, to be discussed. Uh, as we've heard, in, and I'm sure the panel has observed in the briefs to date, in the already this morning, I'm sure we'll talk about it again uh, over the course of the day, one of the hallmarks of the Anderson plaintiff's plans, both legislative and congressional, was the minimization of political subdivision splits. 
And we did this not just as a statistic or not just because of a, a general principle, but because it has very specific benefits for the people of the state of Minnesota. It is a very objective criteria that this panel can use in either adopting or drawing maps to reach outcomes that are beneficial to the citizens of Minnesota. And there are several uh, particular reasons listed here, and I'm not going to read my slides. The panel, I know, will have them afterwards for further um, you know, perusal as it may be helpful. But it's important to emphasize that, that there is longstanding precedent that uh, reducing political subdivision splits minimizes voter confusion. It gives a stronger voice to political subdivisions, which is where government happens in a lot of the, the state of Minnesota at the very local level. Township cities and counties make up our state. Um, splitting political subdivisions um, where, it's, where it does happen can actually hinder communities of interest because it's harder than for the communities, uh, whatever they may be, minority com communities in particular, to advocate to their city leaders who may be in a different district and have different influences. It makes it harder for communities to advocate with a unified voice. Preserving political subdivisions is also a neutral and objective principle that deters gerrymandering. And uh, it is a mechanism that when you're preserving a political subdivision, the, not that we don't take into account other principles, of course we do, but it, it is a touchstone that allows uh, for an objective evaluation of how a plan is succeeding in protecting the citizens of the state. Um, pol preserving political subdivisions also enables the panel to make good choices about how to draw districts without having to try and assess uh, with certain groups, whether again it be minority groups or other groups, are we helping by putting them in one district so they have an equal voice? Are we uh, helping more by giving more voices in multiple districts? Especially in a lot of areas where there is less information available about what those groups actually want and, and what they would, would do to vote. And finally, I think it's important to be aware, too, that providing access to voting is what redistricting is really about. It's not just about what votes people will make and whether they will vote together, but what access do they have to voting uh, locations, to, um, to how efficient uh, is the administration of voting in a particular area, and much of that depends on keeping political subdivisions intact, and particularly with respect to legislative districts, keeping townships connected to the cities uh, that provide a lot of the governmental services, voting and otherwise, in the state of Minnesota. So this, date, this slide is intended to summarize for the panel succinctly how well the Anderson plan stacks up compared not only to the Corey Sachs and Watson plans, but also the Hippert and Zachman plans. Um, we were able to achieve uh, very similar outcomes to the other parties in terms of minority opportunity districts, in terms of population equality, um, convenient and contiguous districts, compact districts, all while minimizing the political subdivision splits of cities, towns, and counties in both uh, congressional districts and House and Senate districts. And our numbers really bear that out. Um, and again, this is important to keep these numbers in mind because these represent real interests of people living in cities, county, counties, and townships where they choose to reside. Turning more to the congressional uh, plan specifically, the Anderson plaintiff's plan is focused on a restrained approach to congressional map making as we discussed in our briefs. This is consistent, again, with, panel, with a panel of judges uh, with the court needing to draw um, the maps in all likelihood uh, in Minnesota in, in this cycle. Um, a restrained approach also results in fair and politically neutral maps and minimizes voter confusion. In many cases, particularly with respect to the congressional map making, um, this means that the districts look similar to how they have in the past, and that's a helpful thing to voters. They know, for the most part, obviously there need to be some changes, but they know who their uh, representative is, they know what district they reside in, and they know how they fit together with other communities within their district. And again, <clears throat> I didn't mention this earlier, but it goes without saying almost, uh, maintaining political subdivisions except to achieve constitutional requirements is a statute in Minnesota, where we start to diverge from that and talk about um, communities of interest, that becomes uh, not a constitutional or uh, statutory requirement, but a much more subjective 
uh, criteria that was, of course, adopted by the panel. Again, we don't discount it entirely. We just think it's important to recognize that it, it does not rise to the level of statutory or, or constitutional criteria. So this, uh, these graphics above show really, again, trying to put it in, in one or two pictures here, that the population changes in the state of Minnesota in the last decade were very similar to the population changes that occurred prior to the drawing of the, uh, the Hippert or, uh, maps 10 years ago. You can see the dark purple correlates to um, the dark green and a lighter purple to orange that really um, in, clarifies that where the, change, the population growth is occurring is very similar, where population loss is occurring is also very similar over the two decades. Again, this then uh, contributes to the concept that um, a restrained approach to redistricting, maintaining essentially the 5-3 population makes sense in this congressional uh, round of redistricting. So this is a picture of the current congressional map as it stands right now, which needs to be with redrawn. And <clears throat> the, Hippert, the, the Zachman panel was the first, of course, to adopt this sort of 5-3 map, by which we mean five of the districts are um, urban, suburban, exurban, and three are more rural. And what we've seen since that uh, Zachman map was adopted 20 years ago is that the population growth has only underscored that that was a good choice and continues to be a good choice. The Hippert panel retained a 5-3 congressional map. And if anything, um, and we can go into the next slide, the Anderson plan um, re reflects that it's even more appropriate now to have a 5-3 plan than in the last 20 years. Because now, almost exactly 5 eighths um, of the state's population lives in the 11-county metropolitan area in St. Cloud, which currently consist of the first, or excuse me, the second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth districts, with the first, seventh, and eighth districts all being more rural in nature. The Sachs and Quarry plans unjustifiably depart from the 5-3 congressional map, inciting growth in the state's minority uh, populations in particular. But we, let's, I think it would be appropriate to take a look at that as well. So these uh, maps on the screen show the state's uh, minority population growth uh, based on voting age population uh, as of 2010 versus the prior cycle and then 2020 uh, versus the prior cycle. And what we see here, similar to the total population changes uh, maps that I showed a few minutes, uh, moments ago, is that again, population growth uh, among minority groups is in very much the same locations it has been over uh, the last 20 years. <clears throat> there has been additional growth in the suburbs uh, surrounding, and I'll get to that in a moment, uh, the, the, the Twin Cities area, and there's been growth overall, which is great. Um, but again, the location of that growth underscores that what's been done for the last 20 years continues to make sense in the state with respect to congressional plans. Uh, the Anderson plaintiffs uh, looked at both um, voting age population and total population, and we did that for a very particular reason. Because, first of all, the representatives in the state of Minnesota are focused on not only, um, they don't just represent those who vote, they represent everybody in the state of Minnesota. And so it's important to re reflect where, <clears throat> excuse me, um, where, where minority populations and groups um, live based on total population as well. And of course, these districts are going to be in effect for at least the next 10 years. And so many of the folks who are not uh, able to vote now will be voting in the years ahead. But again, when we look at total population, again, we can see there has been more growth in the last 10 years uh, in minority populations. But the location of that growth is very similar to where it had been in the um, 2010 census. And this is a, a zoom in um, voting age population on the metro areas, and again, shows that there has been distinct growth uh, in minority group uh, populations in the um, Twin Cities and in the surrounding suburbs, somewhat expanding into the other sub suburbs somewhat, um, but focused on the city's core and some of the same areas, uh, Brooklyn Park, Brooklyn Center, et cetera, that you can see in, in 2010. So all of this data, combined with the fact that political subdivisions don't really change very much, so subject to some annexation and, and some minor changes, uh, caused the Anderson plaintiffs to conclude 
that it makes a lot of sense for the congressional plan to continue to follow uh, essentially the trend uh, started by the Zachman congressional plan and continue with Hippert into Anderson. And comparing the three maps here illustrates that the Anderson congressional plan is a natural progression from the, the Zachman and Hippert plans, taking into account population changes, minority growth changes, um, and, and otherwise a lot of the common characteristics of these districts that have not changed. Um, since uh, the Zachman uh, maps were drawn 20 years ago. When we look at now keeping that natural progression in mind and then look at the Anderson Congressional Plan compared to the Sachs, Corey, and Watson plans, we can see that each of the other plans loses that natural progression. In some ways, the Watson plan is, is most like the Anderson plan in the sense that it is a 5-3 plan. However, it doesn't adhere to the idea that the 8th, 7th, and 1st districts have a natural rural tendency. These are large swaths of the, of the state of Minnesota by a geographic territory. And what the Watson plan does to adjust is go further into the suburban and exurban areas in order to um, maintain their essentially 5-3 but with a more blended approach. And the Sachs and Corey plaintiffs uh, jettison it entirely. And in doing so, they propose, um, in the case of the Sachs plaintiffs, a seventh congressional district that is, was rejected by both the Hippert and the Zachman plan panels, essentially, in that it stretches from the northern to the southern borders and is not uh, convenient or easily traversed, and it combines um, multiple different uh, interests. And the Corey congressional plan um, proposes an eighth district that was rejected by the Hippert panel as not convenient uh, and, and certainly uh, not as favorable, not as appropriate for the citizens as a first district uh, that spans from east to west but is easily traversed by I-90 and has other common interests. So I, I think it's important to remember, too, that it's not that, that part of what we are trying to achieve here is to reflect the overall um, nature of the state of Minnesota in the congressional districts. And so that five three proposal does that. And when we get into the, the uh, more uh, core of the uh, metro areas of the congressional plans, there again, the Anderson plan was very, paid, paid careful attention, and we'll be talking again more about this probably this afternoon, paid careful attention to where are suburban and exurban lines, which are not always black and white, but certainly there is a difference between those communities that start to become more rural or, or more rural-like versus those that are first and second ring suburbs and have more communities of, of interest that way. Um, each of the parties in some respects maintained the city cores of Minneapolis and St. Paul, but we started to see, particularly in the Sachs plan, that the, um, the drawing of the district started to pull in some outer ring suburbs into the city cores in order to keep what are essentially safe DFL districts um, maybe a little less safe, but give a lot more opportunity to the surrounding districts to become less competitive than they currently are. And while, that, and while competitiveness was not a, a criteria the panel adopted, and certainly one we didn't support, it's certainly not inappropriate to note that the districts and the congressional districts in the state have changed hands multiple times in the last decade, which indicates uh, more generally a fairness and balanced nature of those plans. I'd like to take a moment here and talk just briefly about uh, each of the other plans. Uh, I think these, the couple of slides here, and then I'll be skipping ahead because I do want to spend some time on legislative districts as well. But the SACS plan um, really loses the idea of what rural Minnesota can and should be. We have two rural districts, four urban districts, and two blended districts. So we, we keep some sense of, of the urban nature of, uh, or the rural nature of the seventh and first districts, but even those go further into, and particularly the first district, um, create issues of, of putting rural populations uh, in districts where they lose their voice. And that's particularly true in the Sachs plan of the sixth district and the eighth district.
The Cori plan likewise dramatically decreases rural influence in Minnesota's three primarily rural congressional districts. The sixth district rural population increases from 15 to 22.8%, but in doing so, that's not enough to really influence the sixth district in the traditional sense of, of that word. And the suburban counties of Dakota and Scott are then added to the first district, even though cities like Apple Valley, Burnsville, Shakopee, et cetera, uh, really are, are suburban districts more than they are rural uh, or even exurban districts. And then the Cori plan also added more than half of Conner, Carver County, including half of the city of Chaska, to the seventh district. Again, taking a district that has much more suburban characteristics and putting it in what should otherwise be a more rural uh, congressional district. The Watson plan generally maintains the 5-3 approach, as we noted, but all of these, like all these plans, really, splits significantly more political subdivisions. The 8th district ignores the Hippert recognized interest between the East and West. And in doing so, it would appear to us that, uh, at, and I should say this is true of the Cori plan as well, a large um, motivator was to keep the uh, reservations in a common district. And while we certainly, we recognize the panel's um, interest in, in, and the state's interest in protecting reservations and took great pains to do that uh, as well, this approach to northern Minnesota means that all many other interests, inter including the agricultural uh, and, and, and uh, timber, the different uh, industries, the different uh, other interests in the state of uh, Minnesota and the Northland uh, are lost in order for this one, uh, to achieve this one goal. They also result in districts that are not convenient or easily trans transversed. And they are um, result in districts that don't always take into account the fact that, that surrounding areas, and this we see this more in the legislative plans, around these um, reservations uh, can also have uh, be areas that need to be taken into account when thinking about the best interests of both the reservations and the surrounding communities. So with that, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit because I want to make sure I have time for the legislative uh, plans. And so pardon me while I click a bunch of times to do that. We weren't sure if we would have a laptop that would make it easier to just skip ahead. But So turning to the legislative uh, plans, the, Anderson legislat uh, leg the Anderson's approach to legislative map making, again, focused on the fundamentals, population equality, political subdivisions, um, Voting Rights Act, um, the panel's additional criteria on preserving American Indian reservations, but also took into account very specific um, criteria that really we think helped hone in on maps that make sense and lead to uh, achievement of the criteria in a, a very specific and, and successful way. Well, we drew house districts first, uh, again, focusing on the most local areas of government and then paired them to create Senate, Senate districts. We also identified 12 different um, districts throughout the state that were what we have called perfect districts. In other words, they are districts that combine contiguous cities uh, and, and areas that are and townships that um, don't require us to split a single political subdivision in drawing the district. These are relatively easy ways to reduce political subdivision splits, keep cities and count townships together, um, and while also adhering to the other um, pop, uh, criteria around population deviation and communities of interest. Another hallmark of the Anderson plan was that we paid particular attention to keeping townships in districts with the neighboring cities and towns because that is how in rural Minnesota and, and um, even in more, more exurban areas, uh, the, the, those, those political subdivisions work together. Very often townships receive their services, um, are, have a central school, have other uh, local interests that are governed by uh, the city that is near them. Um, as, as some of you may know, it's common for those who live in a township to even call their city on their address, or that, that's where they, um, how they identify. And so we paid careful attention to keeping townships intact and with their neighboring cities and towns. And this has the additional benefit of ensuring that townships, <clears throat> that, that elections can be administered effectively, that um, voting places are accessible, and uh, that communities of interest are maintained. 
We also looked at logical groupings of cities, counties, and townships, and used rivers and major roads as natural district boundaries. We were taken to task a few times for using a river to split a district, for example, or, or to um, or have a district that was had a river in, in it. Where we, every place we did that, we paid careful attention to: is there a bridge nearby? Because it's unlikely individuals are going to walk across the river no matter what. But if there's a Highway 69, for example, right near a district, we took that into account, and again, consistent with the panel's criteria. And this approach resulted in a map that is fair and equitable and complies with all principles. Uh, I'm going to just briefly note this slide, which is that the Anderson plan, compared to the Hippert plan, was even more successful in virtually all respects in minimizing splits of, of uh, cities, townships, and counties. Um, has significantly more minor minority opportunity districts, uh, both by voting age population and by total population, which we considered, uh, and we considered both the reasons identified earlier. This is a, a summary of how the parties' house districts compare. And again, the Anderson plaintiffs do better on uh, virtually all criteria. And where we don't do literally better, we are very close and within the ballpark of others. Uh, for example, the minority opportunity districts, um, we have a couple less in our house districts than the other parties. But when we look at minority opportunity districts from a total population perspective, um, we are at or near the top. And we do this while having a significantly lower number of cities and county splits uh, in our plan. Similarly with the party Senate districts, um, again, we are, um, all the parties in, have addressed or, and will address each of the minority opportunity districts and the splits, but we have to take these things and recognize that there are trade-offs in any map making. Uh, minority opportunity districts um, are, Again, the Anderson plaintiffs are on par with all others and while achieving significant improvements in, in reducing the splits of political subdivisions. One of the other reasons that we wanted to make a point of reducing um, political subdivision splits was that this was something that was particularly taken into account by past uh, panels. And we looked at considerations that were um, factored into the legislative plans by both the Hippert and the Zachman panels. And we noted a number of places, these are two examples on the slide here, where rather than splitting a political subdivision to create smaller population deviation, the panel focused on subdivision boundaries. And often the, the trade-off was um, some smaller increase in population deviation but in all instances, the Anderson plan, like the Hippert and Zachman plans, is well under the population deviation requirements of um, the, uh, this panel's criteria. I think it's important, too, to recognize that political subdivisions are considered by the United States Supreme Court to be a consideration that is of more substance in justifying deviation than from population-based representation than, for example, economic or other sorts of group interests. And that's a quote from Reynolds v. Sims. And I mention that because we heard this morning a lot of attention to you know, how people experience life and communities of interest, which are important. But those we had significant concerns about the extent to which other parties elevated those kinds of criteria above the statutory and constitutional uh, requirements uh, adopted by this panel. And again, this, this slide indicates uh, that counties, cities, and townships are some of the most fundamental communities of interest and centers of local government. And uh, again, they, preserving political subdivisions maintain some of the same um, benefits that we talked about earlier with respect to congressional plans. On this slide, I want to highlight the last bullet, which is that while the Anderson plan doesn't divide the population of a single township, the Sachs plan divides the population of 16 townships, the Watson plan divides 12, and the Quarry plan divides 53 townships. This is just unnecessary in order to achieve a fair and equitable uh, plan for the state of Minnesota. And in fact, 
har harms these smaller communities of interest and local government entities for the reasons that we discussed. I'll note that uh, we're going back to our construct around um, politic uh, perfect districts. We wanted to highlight this for the panel because in the event the panel chooses not to adopt any one of the party's maps, this is an easy way for the panel to look at some districts that might be excellent starting points for both Senate and House districts. I noted this morning as I was going through our slides that we neglected to include one. There are 12 districts, uh, but only 11 are listed in the, on this slide, but 15A in the House districts is also a perfect district. And that, as an example of that, House District, or Senate District 55 uh, is an, exec, an excellent example. Consists of the entire counties. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm on the wrong. It, um, uh, it consists of the uh, cities of Jordan, Prior Lake, and Shakopee, um, certain townships, Jackson, Louisville, Sand Creek, and Spring Lake, and the Shakopee, Mittawakanton um, Sioux Reservation. The Watson Plan proposes the same grouping as Senate District 52, as their Senate District 52. These kinds of districts present the panel with real opportunities to not have to completely start from scratch, but identify some, uh, some areas where what the parties have done can be useful, either in adopting uh, the Anderson plan, of course, as we advocate, or if the panel chooses to draw its own plan. House District 1A is another example of a perfect district, and it consists of the entire counties of Kitson, Roseau, Marshall, and Pennington. Again, the Cory plan proposes the same grouping as House District 1A. And, we, and, and these perfect districts, which appear in multiple plans, further underscores the benefit of looking at uh, legislative districts from this perspective. As I wrap up my, town, my time here uh, this morning, and I will come back to a more uh, granular comparison of some of the congressional and legislative districts this afternoon, I think it's important to be clear that the Anderson plaintiff's plan uses both the consideration of the individual communities as described in great detail in our briefs and uh, illustrated in the districts as, as they exist in our presentation, uh, as well as the objective criteria to achieve plans that are fair and equitable for all the citizens of Minnesota. We did that without creating a, a, a partisan plan. We did that without um, undermining any particular group or interest. And we therefore urge the panel to adopt uh, the plan that was set forth here, both congressional and legislative plan by the Anderson plaintiffs. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. We'll next hear from counsel on behalf of the Secretary of State. Good morning. You may proceed when you're ready. I don't have a um, visual presentation, nor am I going to take anywhere near 30 minutes, I don't think. Um, but time to go. go ahead. Good morning, Your Honors. My name is Nathan Hartshorn. I'm an Assistant Attorney General, and I'm here representing Secretary of State Steve Simon. As you're aware, the Secretary hasn't submitted a redistricting plan. I don't have specific comments or responses. Uh, to present regarding the other party's plans. I just have one very short point that the Secretary wants to reiterate. It stems from one of the redistricting principles that the panel has already adopted, the one that counsel for the Anderson plaintiffs just discussed. That's the sixth principle concerning preserving political subdivisions to the extent possible. There are several good reasons for that principle, um, such as avoiding voter confusion, which is a very good reason. The Secretary wanted to emphasize a further basis for that principle this morning, which is the connection between the principle and the costs and administrative burdens that local governments bear when they conduct elections. The short version is just that drawing new district lines that split local jurisdictions makes future elections harder to run. The simplest example of this would be a small municipality, a township, a small town, that currently has only one election precinct. If a new legislative boundary is drawn through that municipality, the cost of administering elections in that jurisdiction essentially doubles because election precincts can't cross district boundaries. One precinct has to become two. So even if the election we're running today or next week happens to be a March election for mayor, I suppose that wouldn't be next week, but this is hypothetical. 
um, if it happens to be a March election for mayor or a school district referendum, in other words, something that has nothing to do with legislative districts, that doesn't matter. Because of that legislative district boundary, there still need to be two precincts, two sets of vote tallying equipment, two staffs of election judges, and all the rest. So creating new election precincts can impose significant financial and administrative burdens on local election officials. And so the state's chief election official, the secretary, thought that that was important to raise. Now, of course, there are countervailing interests. And I mean, and the sixth principle recognizes that, uh, that, um, that these kinds of divisions of local jurisdictions are permitted where there are constitutional reasons and constitutional requirements for them. And that's absolutely correct. The, the, the principle that I'm emphasizing here is not the prime directive of this entire process. However, the, um, the, the fact of these burdens on local election staffs is something that the Secretary of State um, would very much like the panel to keep in mind when drawing these maps. Again, this is not a particular criticism of any plan that one of the plaintiff groups has, uh, has submitted. It's just a consideration that, for the, that the Secretary urges the panel to keep in mind. That's all I have. I'm happy to answer any questions the panel may have. Thank you, Your Honor. Seeing none, thank you, Counsel. We will take a 10 minute break um, right now and resume the hearing, I guess, at 10.50.
Please be seated. And we will proceed with further, further argument. Now hearing from counsel for the Sachs plaintiffs. morning and I understand you will both be presenting argument and will abide by the time as indicated. That's correct. Thank you. You may proceed when you're ready. Good morning. Happy New Year. May it please the court. My name is Ben Stafford. I represent the Sachs plaintiffs along with Mr. Zoll. And I'll start with the congressional plan before turning it over to Mr. Zoll for the legislative plans. There's a fundamental tension during any redistricting cycle, particularly when the judiciary is tasked with drawing maps. On one hand, using the prior map as a baseline helps ensure consistency and minimizes voter confusion. On the other hand, in order to ensure fair and effective representative representation for all Minnesotans, any new maps must reflect the current demographic geography of the state, and in particular changes that have occurred over the past decade. As previous panels have noted, judicial redistricting requires a thoughtful and deliberative approach, one that relies on neutral standards rather than fraught political considerations. And the principles adopted by this panel during this cycle will ensure that the new maps preserve public confidence and fairness. And the Sachs plaintiff's proposed congressional plan represents the most conscientious and thorough application of the panel's principles. The other parties to these proceedings have either focused on principles that were not adopted by the panel or on certain adopted principles at the expense of others. The Sachs plaintiffs, by contrast, have considered and applied all of the panel's principles and produced maps that make sense given where and how Minnesotans live and work in 2021. In our briefing, we went principle by principle, District 1 through District 8, to describe our plan. Rather than repeat this approach, we'll instead describe our map in a more holistic fashion that emphasizes where changes need to be made and how we chose to make them. The starting point of a new map, of course, is population. This chart shows the deviations of the current congressional districts from the ideal population of 713,312. And as the panel can see, by far the districts with the most significant underpopulation are the 7th and 8th congressional districts. These districts have to expand. They have to take population from other districts. And so that's where we'll begin. We'll work our way outside in based on which districts need to pick up population. Because of Minnesota's boundaries, of course, the 8th district can pick up population either by going west or by going south. Similarly, the 7th district has to go either east or south. But the east district, 8th district rather, going markedly west, or the 7th district going markedly east is really a non-starter. As both previous panels and public testimony this time recognized, northeastern and northwestern Minnesota have historically been divided into two districts. And that reflects the significant distinctions between the agricultural areas of the Red River Valley and western Minnesota, and the mining and timber interests of the Iron Range and the Northeast. Nor does it make a lot of sense for the 7th District to head east into St. Cloud and toward the Twin Cities metropolitan area in any marked way. As the Hippert panel noted 10 years ago, it did not receive any arguments from the parties to that action, public comment, or data demonstrating that the city of St. Cloud's interests are aligned with the agriculturally based 7th Congressional District. And that's still true today. Moving, so accordingly, both districts need to move south to pick up population, which notably is exactly what the Hippert panel did 10 years ago for these two districts. Indeed, District 7 has been creeping south ever since the 1980s in every successive redistricting cycle. Moving the 7th District south also has the benefit of uniting the state's agricultural regions along the western border. And in the process, that helps shape a more compact, unified 1st District. 
Right now, the first district stretches, of course, all the way along the state's southern border. And it's important to recognize the historical context of that configuration. That was, as the panel drew it in Hippert, 10 years previous to that, the Zachman panel, for the first time, due to population in the greater Minnesota area lagging behind population growth in the Twin Cities, it became necessary for the first time to have a district that stretched all the way across the state. And the Zachman panel basically picked the least bad option at the time. Before that, southwestern and southeastern Minnesota had always been in separate districts. But as a result of that decision, a strip of the state's agricultural counties, Rock, Nobles, Jackson, are divided from their similar neighbors to the immediate north, and they are instead linked with disparate communities in the more urban, technology-focused southeast hours away. And the only justification for this configuration provided by the Hippert panel and the Zachman panel before it is that I-90 creates a community of interest. But whatever unity the highway creates really pales in comparison to the growing distinctions between a town like Worthington and a city like Rochester, which has continued to grow markedly over the last 20 years. No one would seriously suggest, for example, that Moose Lake and St. Paul share any notable community of interest because it's possible to drive between them on I-35. And the same is true here as well. As we also noted in our brief, state government services already recognize distinctions between the southeast and the southwestern corners of the state. And this panel, we would submit, should do the same. Even the Department of Transportation doesn't use I-90 to delineate a single regional area of service it too recognizes distinct southeastern and southwestern service areas. By shifting the southwest counties into the agricultural 7th district, and again, we're talking about a single strip of counties at this point. The rest has already been taken by the 7th district over the years. So one last strip of counties in the southwest. By moving those districts into the agricultural 7th district, the panel can then reachieve population equality in the 1st district, which is also somewhat underpopulated, notwithstanding continued growth in the Rochester area, by making another change that was heavily emphasized during the public hearings, uniting the Mississippi River counties along the southeast border. Public testimony uh, confirmed that Goodhue and Wabasha counties have much more in common with Winona and Houston counties than they do with increasingly suburban communities in Dakota County. The Sachs plaintiff's proposed first congressional district unites not only these river counties, but also the communities around Rochester and Mankato that rely on these regional hubs for employment and services. The result is a first district that's more compact and more coherent and quite similar to the district as it stood before it was stretched across the entire state by the Zachman panel. And once again, this domino effect as we continue to move around the state produces positive effects in the next district the second. Removing the disparate river counties from the suburban second allows the district to unite similar communities in the southern metro area and northern Washington County. And we made this change to try to be directly responsive to public testimony that the panel heard that urged the unification of these increasingly similar suburban communities. In particular, members of the public urged the panel not to treat the Minnesota River as a barrier, given that a community like Bloomington does share vital economic and recreational links with Burnsville and Egan. Elsewhere, the Sachs Plant has proposed second district similarly forgoes arbitrary barriers in favor of drawing together the suburban southeast metro areas into an extremely compact district. So that brings us to the core of the Twin Cities which is similar to the enacted map under our proposal. The fourth district remains anchored in St. Paul, but reconfiguring the communities along the Wisconsin border prevents the three-way split of Washington County that is in both the enacted map and some of the other parties' proposed maps. The fifth district, in turn, is still based in the heart of Minneapolis, filling in remaining population with linked bedroom communities in the north heading into Anoka. And the third district remains a western suburban district, highly compact, centered in Hennepin County, and with our configuration curing the split of Edina that's in the current map. 
So that leaves us the sixth district. Historically, the sixth district, frankly, has been treated as something of a leftovers district, um, taking in a vast swath of the outer metropolitan area that simply doesn't fit neatly into the state's other districts and linking it with St. Cloud. Given population patterns at the time, that's basically what was necessary to maintain the basic divide between greater Minnesota and the Twin Cities metro. A sixth that has aspects of both. You can see this in the enacted map. The sixth district has a rather ungainly shape, a little bit eccentric, squeezing all around the Twin Cities, kind of like a vice. As a result, the enacted sixth places northern Washington County in the same district as western Carver County. And to underscore the arbitrariness of the current shape, it would take about an hour, assuming good traffic, to drive from Hugo in Washington County to Cologne in Carver County. And under the enacted map, you have to pass through three other congressional districts to do that drive, even though both are in the same district right now. Given population shifts over the last 10 years, it's now both possible and entirely logical to draw a sixth district comprising of a more coherent and compact area. And that's what we propose, a district that not only takes on a more compact shape, it anchors in St. Cloud and becomes a more exurban focused district, keeping Western Carver County, adding similar Scott County, and shedding the disparate more far flung communities in Anoka and Northern Washington County. So that ends a, a quick tour of our proposed congressional map, which we hope demonstrates that our proposed districts make sensible, justified changes to the enacted map while retaining its basic shape and 5-3 configuration. As discussed in our plan submission briefing, our plan readily satisfies the plan panel's redistricting requirements. It achieves population equality. It, the districts are composed of convenient, contiguous territory to maximize opportunities for Minnesota's minority communities uh, to influence elections. We include a plan with two districts where the minority voting age population exceeds 30% and two where it exceeds 20%. We also endeavored to minimize subdivision splits where possible and also attempted to uh, eliminate splits in the enacted map that drew particular criticism during the public hearing process, in particular the three-way split of Washington County and the division of Edina. And finally, our proposed congressional plan is actually more compact than the Hibbert panel's adopted plan. The satisfaction of these neutral criteria demonstrate that this map was drawn to group Minnesotans into congressional districts with others who share their interests and thus to ensure that all citizens of the state, Republican, Democrat, and independent alike, are effectively represented in the United States Congress. Thank you. Thank you, members of the panel. As Mr. Stafford uh, mentioned, I'm David Zoll of Lockridge Grindle Nowen, and I'll be presenting the legislative plan for the Sachs plaintiffs. You will not hear me describe any perfect districts today as I'm presenting our plan. As Mr. Stafford indicated, there's always a tension when preparing legislative districts or congressional districts uh, between what was done before and the principles that have been adopted, and I say even between principles. Uh, sometimes they're competing, and there's trade-offs between them. You may preserve political subdivisions, but at the cost of increasing population deviations. This was a balancing that was mentioned by both Zachman and Hippert panels in the portions that were cited uh, by the presentation from the Anderson plaintiffs. There is this tension. It's always there. And it's not just with respect to political subdivisions and population deviation. Uh, there's tension and trade-offs between, for example, protecting minority rights, in which cases you may have to sacrifice compactness or convenience. There's always these trade-offs. But even though there are no perfect legislative districts and no singular perfect plan, I submit that there is a best plan. And the best plan is the one that embraces and balances all of the principles adopted by this panel that responds to the public testimony and creates fair maps to address how Minnesota has changed over the last 10 years. And I submit respectfully that the best plan presently in front of this panel 
is the SACS plan. And that's because it takes care to balance and consider all of these principles. None is elevated amongst the others. All of them are given consideration. With the time that we have today, I obviously cannot walk through and describe all 67 Senate districts and 134 House districts. So instead, with respect to our legislative plan, I'm going to address how it addresses each of the, the principles that have been adopted by this panel. And I'll start where I think is a natural place to start, which is a de minimis population deviation from the ideal. The ideal of 85,000 uh, approximately for Senate districts and 42,500 for the House districts. Why start there? Well, after all, this is the reason that we're here uh, having this redistricting process, is to balance the population across Minnesota's legislative districts. If we look at the plans proposed by the various parties, you can see that all of them, with respect to the Senate districts, have deviations less than 2%, the 2% maximum established by this panel. However, the SACS plan, which is highlighted here in blue, along with the plans proposed by Anderson and Corey plaintiffs, achieve significantly lower population deviations than that 2% maximum. Every Senate district in the SACS plan is within 1% of the ideal population with a mean deviation of 0.42%. Now thinking of it in percentage is a little abstract. Um, so in the context of roughly 85,000 uh, people in a Senate district, the SACS plan average deviation is 359 individuals. You can see also that the parties perform similarly with respect to the deviations in their house districts. Again, everybody is within the 2% maximum but the SACS plan, again highlighted in blue, for every house district is within 1% of the ideal, and the mean deviation across all house districts is 0.56% or 237 people. The SACS plan achieves a de minimis deviation from the ideal population for both the Senate and house districts. So let's move on to the next principle in, in my presentation, which is protecting the equal opportunity for minorities to participate in the political process and to elect candidates of their choice. We've seen a chart similar to this in other presentations. And I'll just note that the SACS plan with respect to the Senate creates three majority minority Senate districts and six minority opportunity districts, those being districts in which the total voting age population is at least 30%. And I want to highlight a few of these districts for you. Uh, on this slide, uh, we see the three majority minority Senate districts. Those are Senate districts 51, 59, and 67. You also see two of the minority opportunity districts. Uh, and I note that those two, Senate District 62 and 65, fall just short of that 50% majority-minority threshold. And as the younger population in those districts reaches voting age, we expect that these will become majority-minority districts, in which case we would match the total of five majority-minority districts created by the plan submitted by the Cory plaintiffs. Turning to the House, you can see that the SACS plan creates nine majority minority districts, and 15 minority opportunity districts, for a total of 24, matching the number created by the Cory plants. I'm just going to take a brief review of where these are located. Starting in the northwestern suburbs, we have two minority majority, or excuse me, majority minority districts, 51A and 51B, which are anchored in Brooklyn Park and Brooklyn Center. In the surrounding districts, all create minority opportunity districts. In the northeastern suburbs, we have two minority opportunity districts, 39B and 41B, centered in Maplewood, North St. Paul, and Oakdale. In the South Metro, as with other plans, we have Shakopee uh, creating a minority opportunity district, along with Burnsville. And I note the Shakopee 55A district includes the Shakopee Medwakanton Sioux community. Also, we have 58A and 58B on the north side of the river in Bloomington and Richfield. 
Finally, turning to the core of the Twin Cities, excuse me, in Minneapolis. I won't describe these in detail, but you can see that we create three majority minority districts, 59A and B in North Minneapolis, and 62B in the Midtown area, along with three additional minority opportunity districts. And similarly in St. Paul, we have four majority minority districts located generally north and east of downtown St. Paul, along with minority opportunity districts, uh, a minority opportunity district in 65B, which includes roughly the downtown St. Paul area uh, and the area west of the Mississippi River, or as you look at it on the map, south uh, of the river. There can be no question, I think, that the SACS plan promotes opportunity for minorities, as you can see with the minority opportunity dist districts and the majority minority districts which are created in the plan. For the first time, this panel adopted a principle requiring that all contiguous portions of federally recognized American Indian reservations not be split between districts. The SACS plan keeps all contiguous portions of reservations together. And it's also drawn to promote the strength of the Native American vote in northwestern Minnesota. And you can see that how that is done here with House District 2A, which includes Red Lake and White Earth, and creates a House district with a minority voting age population of 28%, just shy of creating another minority opportunity district. And then when we step further out from House District 2A to look at the Senate district, Leech Lake Reservation and Bemidji also join in to create a, a Senate district which includes the totality of three reservations and has a minority voting age population of 26%. So not only does the SACS plan preserve the reservation boundaries, it ensures that members of Red Lake, White Earth, and the Leech Lake bands will have a significant voice in the legislative elections. We've heard significant discussion already this morning regarding political subdivisions. The SACS plan follows this principle that political subdivisions must not be divided more than necessary to meet constitutional requirements. And as you will see through this presentation, it does that while effectively balancing that principle with the other principles adopted by this panel. This slide shows the political subdivision splits within the party's respective Senate map, or Senate plans. As you can see, the SACS plan, highlighted in blue, performs comparably well when compared to the other plans. The same is true on the House side. And I want to note, particularly looking at the cities and township splits, uh, because there has been so much emphasis on preserving political subdivisions. The SACS plan has a total of 69 splits, cities and townships that, that would be split in that plan. The Anderson plan splits 43. That's a 26 city and township difference, but you need to put that into context. There's a total of 2,741 cities and townships in the state of Minnesota. If we look at not the number that are split, but the number that are preserved, the SACS plan preserves, leaves intact, 97.4% of the cities and townships in the state of Minnesota. The Anderson plan, 98.4. That, that's only a 1% difference. And as I mentioned in my introductory comments, there's always a trade-off. What do you gain for that 1% difference you gain minority representation, and you gain, as I will address further in this presentation, preservation of communities of interest in maps that are fair and account for all of the changes that have occurred in Minnesota over the years. Because none of the plans perform dramatically better than the others with respect to political subdivision splits, they should be judged and evaluated not on the number of splits, but on how they split and how those splits are consistent with the principles adopted by this panel. I want to highlight in my remaining time 
a few Senate districts incorporated into the SACS plan. And I'll start with Senate District 4, which includes the Moorhead area in surrounding communities. House District 4A includes the city of Moorhead, and House District 4B includes the remainder of Clay County, a portion of Norman County, and four townships in Becker County. This is consistent with the plan that was adopted by the Hippert panel and that, that branch that extends into Becker County. You heard this mentioned by counsel for the Watson plaintiffs, is to connect the city of Detroit Lakes with Moorhead, where we heard significant public testimony about the connection between Moorhead and Detroit Lakes. Moving south and east, we come to St. Cloud. It has a population of 69,000 individuals, and we're able to keep all of St. Cloud, together with St. Joseph and Waite Park, in Senate District 14. The SACS plan for Senate District 14 preserves minority voting rights. It creates compact and trans traversable Senate House districts and recognizes the distinction between the urban areas of St. Cloud and the interests of the surrounding rural communities. Importantly, the SACS plan also ensures that the St. Cloud State University campus is included entirely with House District 14B. Again, this is a significant point of the public testimony before this panel. And we keep St. Cloud State University whole in one house district as opposed to splitting it as is currently done with the Hippert plan. Again, continuing southeast to Rochester, our plan divides the city of Rochester into three house districts, essentially, as was done by the Watson plaintiffs. And it was done for this reason. It allows voters that are live, living on the periphery of the city of Rochester and the surrounding communities to vote with the community where they work, where they shop, and where they identify. The three house districts are contained entirely within Olmstead County, and the House District 26B continues uh, east to Wabasha County for population balance purposes. Again, this proposal, this plan for the city of Rochester is consistent with the public testimony, which asked this panel to keep the communities on the periphery of the city connected with the core, because they truly identify as one community, and it preserves the minority voting that is split or separated between the core of the city and on the periphery. On the northwest side of the Twin Cities, the SACS plan addresses two shortcomings with the current map. First, it eliminates a Champlin and Coon Rapids parent, uh, which was discussed earlier, that creates a de district that is not traversable. Uh, voters could not reach a portion of the district on the opposite side of the Mississippi River without leaving the district. Our plan fixes that by ensuring that there's a bridge, that there's a crossing of the river within each district. Second, in response to the strong public testimony, the SACS plan keeps Coon Rapids whole within a single Senate district. It's currently split between three Senate districts and four House districts. This plan keeps Coon Rapids whole, as was repeatedly requested through the public testimony. Finally, I want to move to the southern suburbs. There was discussion uh, by the Watson, Council for the Watson plaintiffs regarding the split of Bloomington, uh, or merging Bloomington with the communities to the south. Mr. Sienkowski noted that he lived in Bloomington when he was describing the way the Watson plan was drawn. I live in the South Metro. I regularly drive 35W from Burnsville into Bloomington. I regularly drive Cedar Avenue from Egan into uh, Bloomington near the Mall of America. And I can tell you, and you don't have to take my word for it because you can listen to the public testimony that those communities don't see the river as a division. It is a unifying feature in the South Metro. And the, the testimony from James Johnson I found particularly compelling because it resonates with my own experience driving through the South Metro. As you come across I-35W, from Burns, you, you go from the heart of Burnsville right into the heart of Bloomington. It's one continuous community. Uh, and if you go east, 
Okay? And you're driving Cedar Avenue out of Apple Valley. You pass through Egan. And right before you get to the river, you go past the new premium outlet mall right there. You cross the river. What's the first thing you see again on the right-hand side of the highway? It's the Mall of America. You have an economic and commerce connection between those communities. And I see it when I drive there. You see it when you drive there. And the individuals who testified saw it when they drove there. And that's the reason for drawing those communities together, is to see the river not as a dividing point, but as something that links them. I want to make one final note as I close, and that's this. The Sachs legislative plan is not a partisan plan. It was not drawn to favor incumbents. It was not drawn to favor candidates. It was not drawn to favor a political party. It was drawn to fully embrace all the principles adopted by this panel. Thank you. Thank you both. We will next hear from counsel on behalf of the Corey plaintiffs. Good morning. Good morning. You may proceed when you are ready. Good morning, members of the panel. My name is Brian Dillon, and along with Amy Erickson from the Lathrop GPM law firm, we're, we proudly represent the Corey plaintiffs. The Corey plaintiffs are made up of seven diverse individuals and three nonprofit organizations that intervened and were granted party status in this matter to represent the voices and interests of Minnesota's diverse communities, uh, which are growing rapidly. Uh, the Corey plaintiffs are a unique participant in these proceedings in that we are not affiliated with any political party like the Sachs and Anderson plaintiffs, and we are not self-proclaimed redistricting aficionados like Mr. Watson and his group. We are here simply to ensure that Minnesota's growing minority communities, which have been historically underrepresented in the Minnesota legislature and in Congress, had the opportunity to be separately represented and heard by this panel. My presentation this morning is gonna be divided into three parts. In the first part, I'm gonna to talk to you about how and why the Cory plaintiffs engaged diverse communities throughout Minnesota in developing our redistricting plans in a, in a very grassroots fashion, respect, reflecting kind of the unique nature of our, our group in particular. Uh, in part two, I'm gonna to talk to you about how our, our plan adheres to all of the neutral redistricting principles that were adopted by this panel but also why we focused as much as possible on preserving diverse and minority communities of interest in order to amplify their ability uh, to influence elections. And finally, in part three, with the time that I have left, I'm gonna highlight some of the diverse community leaders who informed the development of our plan and who helped make sure that our plan best preserves the collective interests of communities of color throughout this state. So let me begin uh, by, by talking about how our plan was developed. And as I mentioned, it was, it was developed in a very unique and grassroots fashion. Uh, and it was informed um, by uh, and supported by two, two different nonpartisan initiatives. One, the Minnesota Census Mobilization Partnership, and two, the RMAPS Minnesota Campaign. The Census Mobilization Partnership was a nonpartisan effort that was designed to ensure that Minnesota's diverse and historically undercounted communities were fully and accurately counted during the 2020 census process. And its efforts reached 1.3 million Minnesotans and helped ensure that Minnesota achieved the number one response rate nationally in terms of census participation. As, as this panel and, and all of the parties know, Minnesota maintained its eighth congressional seat by just 89 residents over the state of New York. And all of Minnesota has the Minnesota Census Partner, Mobilization Partnership and the diverse communities who came out and made sure they were counted to thank for that critically important work. Uh, the RMAPS Minnesota campaign is another nonpartisan effort that essentially built on the momentum and the infrastructure that was built during the census process, but it focused its efforts on redistricting. Uh, this campaign was led by the Minnesota Council on Foundations and Common Cause, receiving critical input and contributions from a number of prominent 
minority-led, and serving organizations throughout the state of Minnesota. And this coalition engaged the same diverse communities in redistricting that the Census Mobilization engage, Partnership engaged during the census process. And the campaign's goal was simple, to develop a redistricting plan that best preserves diverse communities of interest in an effort to make government more responsive to their needs and interests. And how did our, how did our plan come together? And what, what, what specifically were the nuts and bolts of the process? Interestingly, I think the Cory plaintiffs are the only party in these proceedings to actually answer that question for the panel. For much of 2021, the RMAPS Minnesota campaign and its coalition members met every two weeks for two hour mapping sessions. The sessions were conducted in five languages, engaged every racial and ethnic group in Minnesota, and drew participation from over 400 individuals around the state. These sessions gave participants the opportunity to share stories about their communities, to talk about the interests and issues that bind them together, uh, to talk about the redistricting process and how it has the potential to amplify the collective voices of diverse communities and community members throughout this state, and to figure out how boundaries could be drawn to make elected officials more responsive to their needs and interests. And the, the work product that, that the RMAPS Minnesota campaign developed is what we refer to as the unity map. And the unity map consists of 40 different community interests, community of interest maps based on information shared and generated through these two hour mapping sessions, hundreds of hours of grassroots engagement of diverse communities throughout the state of Minnesota. And the unity map is essentially the foundation of the Cory plaintiffs redistricting plans. We started there, that's the core. And from there, we completed our statewide plans by drawing district boundaries that we believe, based on the input from these communities, best preserves the ability of minority individuals and groups to influence elections. It's important for us to explain this background to the panel for a, a couple of different reasons. One, again, I think it demonstrates why we are so unique. We are the only party ever in the history of any judicial redistricting proceeding in Minnesota, and there have been several, as this panel is well aware, to directly and proactively engage Minnesota's minority communities in this way on redistricting issues to make sure that their voices were heard. We did not rely on institutional party or partisan knowledge and experience. We did not handcuff ourselves to existing maps that were drawn decades ago when Minnesota looked much, much different and was much less diverse. And we didn't rely on the record that was developed during the public comment period established by this pa panel, which was of course important, but by definition and necessity came from a cross section of our population that was aware of what the panel was doing and had the wherewithal to actually engage in that process. We went deeper. We went deeper for the purpose of engaging diverse community leaders and members and community led organizations where they live, where they work, and where they interact to better understand their interests, their needs, the things that bind them together, to understand how government is working and not working for them, uh, and to collaborate with them to make sure that their input, uh, that the panel knew and understands what they want to see out of this new redistricting plan that's gonna govern our elections for the next 10 years. We also wanna make a record of how this plan came together because it demonstrates that Minnesota's minority and historically underrepresented communities not only wanna be engaged in the redistricting process, but they can lead it. Because at bottom, you know, we've talked about all the principles and of course we need to follow the principles, but at bottom, Redistricting is about people. It's about communities of people and trying to figure out a way to make government and elected officials as responsive as possible to the people and the communities that they are elected to serve. It's not about political parties or partisan interests. It's not about incumbents or where they live. It's not about existing boundaries that were drawn 10 years ago or 10 years before that. And it's not about drawing new boundaries that will make the next elections simpler and more efficient and cost effective for local administrators. That's not what this is about. We go through this process every 10 years because as people move in and out of communities, the demographic makeup and population makeup of those communities, it shifts and it changes. Some communities grow, some maintain and others shrink. 
And in order to make sure every person's vote counts the same, we go through this process every 10 years. And, and so the purpose of, of this process, that the, the panel's job, is to come up with new district boundaries that reflect where Minnesota's population is today. Where are we today? Not 10 years ago or 10 years before that. And we can get, glean a lot from the 2020 census data about where Minnesota is today. And there are a couple of main takeaways uh, from, where, from the census data that I wanna, uh, want to highlight. This, this map of Minnesota comes from uh, our state's demographer, uh, Susan Brower's August 2021 presentation to the House Redistricting Committee. The counties shaded in blue uh, identify uh, counties that actually gained in population over the last 10 years, and the counties shaded in orange identify populations or, or counties that lost population. And on the whole, Minnesota gained 400,000 residents statewide over the last 10 years. But, but these, these, these charts show, and the Anderson plaintiffs uh, highlighted this as well, that that population growth is highly concentrated in our urban and suburban areas. Almost 78% 70, of, of the population growth over the last 10 years is accounted for in the seven county Twin Cities metro area. And so what does that mean for redistricting? Well, it, it means, of course, that rural voting areas are gonna need to gain in area in order to pick up the population that they lost, and the urban voting districts are gonna to need to shed population in order to equalize uh, the, the number of voters and or number, the population in each district. That's just math. But what else do we know about the population growth in Minnesota over the last 10 years? We know that it was driven entirely by Minnesota's minority communities. And this graphic helps to illustrate that growth. This also comes from Ms. Brower's presentation to the House Redistricting Committee. And it demonstrates that Minnesota's minority communities grew by 454,000 residents over the last 10 years and now make up 24% of the state's overall population. This graphic also, also shows which minority groups are growing the fastest. Led by the black and African American communities, which added more than 156,000 people, followed by the Asian community, which added 110,000 people, and the Hispanic and Latino community, which grew by 95,000 people. Meanwhile, by comparison, Minnesota's white population statewide shrunk by 51,000 residents. And why is that? Why, why are these numbers important here? Well, again, without the BIPOC growth, without the minority growth in Minnesota over the last 10 years, we would have lost our eighth congressional district. It also demonstrates that Minnesota is quickly becoming a much more diverse state and from our perspective, in order to be credible, the redistricting plan ultimately adopted by this plan panel should center the perspectives and interests of Minnesota's diverse communities. Put them at the forefront to the greatest extent possible. Of course, as we did, we must comply with all the neutral uh, redistricting principles, but to the greatest extent possible, focus on preserving Minnesota's diverse communities of interest and protecting the ability of minority communities to elect uh, representatives of their choice. Because our track record in Minnesota on electing diverse candidates, quite frankly, is not great. Uh, in, in the Minnesota legislature right now, only 12% of our elected officials come from diverse backgrounds. And in our state's history, we've elected only two members to Congress who come from diverse backgrounds. And that track record, we think, very clearly helps to explain why Minnesota ranks among the worst states in various disparities along racial lines, whether you look at education, uh, small business funding, affordable housing, you name it. Our disparities are not something to be proud of and we can do better. And we think it starts with redistricting. The diversity index is another metric that I wanted to just highlight. This comes from the, a metric that the US Census Bureau uh, assesses every 10 years based on the census data uh, it's a measure to kind of assess the probability that two persons chosen at random in a particular area will be from a different racial or ethnic background. It's another way to just assess the relative diversity of a particular area. And a value of zero uh, reflects complete homogeneity, no diversity whatsoever, meaning every person in that population is of the same racial and ethnic background. A value of one represents complete diversity on the other end of the spectrum, 
meaning every person chosen at random would be of, of a different uh, racial or ethnic background as you. And on a statewide basis, from 2010 to 2020, Minnesota's diversity index jumped by 10 full percentage points, such that today, statewide across Minnesota, there's a 40% chance that the next person chosen at random from our state's population will be of a different uh, racial and ethnic background as you. And where is that diversity concentrated? Where, are, where which counties are most diverse? Uh, well, this this chart illustrates that in the tw the Twin Cities in the Twin Cities metro area and the surrounding suburbs, uh, Dakota, Anoka, and Scott County, the southeast Minnesota counties of Olmsted and Mower, the southwest Minnesota counties of uh, Nobles and Watonwan, and the northwest Minnesota counties of Monoman and Beltrami. That's where you will find the most diversity on a county to county basis in the state of Minnesota. And it's not surprising that these concentrated areas of diversity correlate very well with where the Cori plan is focused in developing our redistricting plans. Hmm. There we go, okay. Um, so let me shift now into part two of my presentation where, where I wanna talk about the principles that we followed, the, the neutral redistricting principles that we followed. Um, but before I talk about the principles that we did follow, I wanna talk about a non-principle that we did not follow. Because we followed all the principles that the panel adopted in its November 18th order, but we didn't follow a least change approach because the least change approach is not a principle that this panel adopted. And why didn't we follow the least change approach? Well, the least change approach would unnecessarily limit this panel's ability to account for the dynamic racial and ethnic changes that Minnesota has experienced over the last 10 years. It's unnecessarily constraining. The panel's challenge is to start fresh and meet the moment and be guided by the neutral principles you adopted, but don't be restrained by a principle you didn't adopt because too much has happened in Minnesota over the last 10 years. We are not the same Minnesota we were 10 years ago. We are much more diverse and new electoral boundaries should be drawn that best reflect that diversity and give minority populations in Minnesota a greater ability to elect candidates of their choice who share their experiences, who share their backgrounds, and who will be responsive to their concerns and their interests. Because that's what we did. That's what we did. We followed all the principles we, we score well uh, and compare favorably to all the other parties on every single principle, but we were not guided by a least change approach. Uh, we're also not shy about admitting that although we followed all the principles, we, we focused on two principles in particular, and I've already mentioned this. We focused in particular on preserving diverse communities of color whenever possible and consistent with every other principle, and on enhancing the ability of diverse communities to influence elections consistent with the 14th and 15th Amendments and the Voting Rights Act. All, of, all the parties had to make choices. This is a balancing act, and, and we agree with that. Uh, but we are transparent about where we focused. We balanced them all, but we focused on these two in particular because we think it's critically important and it's necessary at this time in our state's history. So let's dig in a little bit on our plans. And I'll start with our congressional plan. Uh, our, congressional, our congressional plan is comprised of eight convenient, contiguous, and compact districts. We meet all the objective measures on these three factors. We're on par with every other party. Um, some of the other parties take issue with our eighth congressional district. Um, you know, it, it, it is a northern district, and, and we're proud of it. We drew it intentionally because it preserves most of Minnesota's Native American lands and populations in the north and gives those Native American populations a, a better opportunity and ability than they've ever had before to make a congressional representative more responsive to their needs and their interests. And it's a uniquely northern district, right? What is more unifying in Minnesota than our pride in being a northern state, right? And that is true of our northern counties. that it, it, They are bound together by their north-centric identity, right? And, you know, there, there's been a lot of talk about I-90 connecting uh, the southern half of the state. Well, Highway 2 connects the northern half of the state, and it bisects our congressional district 8 from Bemidji uh, or from, from Duluth 
uh, in the east of Bemidji in the center and on, on west to North Dakota. You know, every, every single congressional plan has districts that are large in area and are going to arguably uh, connect communities that might have some differences. But we think our congressional district eight, particularly because it unites uh, the American Indian populations as best as possible, uh, is appropriate and should be um, adopted by this panel. We also split uh, the Southwest and Southeast districts, our, our seventh and our first into two. Uh, the Sachs plaintiff, plaintiffs addressed why they did this. We agree with their rationale. Those two, di th those two counties uh, are, are growing different uh, and, and those differences should be, should be reflected. Our legislative plan, uh, here's a picture of it at a, at a very high level. Again, it's, it's comprised of districts that are convenient, contiguous, and compact. Again, we meet all the objectives uh, or the, the metrics for convenience, contiguousness, and compactness, uh, which are primarily about district shape. You know, on these metrics, our plans are on par with all the others. In the afternoon session, we'll give you a, a few con comparison and contrasting examples. E every plan has some districts that folks could quibble with. The question is, why did, you, why did you draw the lines where you did? What was motivating you? And in our situation, whenever we drew a district that might look a little funky to somebody else, it's because we were attempting to preserve communities of interest, particularly diverse communities of interest, uh, in order to maximize their ability to influence elections. The ideal population requirement. Um, I'll touch briefly on this. I mean, you know, the fact of the matter is that, uh, as I mentioned, our population growth has been centered in urban and suburban areas, and as a result, uh, the urban and suburban areas are going to have to shrink uh, in size, and the rural areas are going to have to grow in size in order to equalize population, right? The question is how best to do that, right? What are the principles that guide you, and where are you going to focus? What choices will you make? You know, well, we, we chose not to follow a least change, least change approach, approach for the reasons that I discussed. We followed all the, neutral all the neutral principles, but whenever possible, we focused on preserving diverse communities in order to amplify their ability to influence. Our legislative plan actually scores better than any other party on the ideal population principle. Our, our plan has much less deviation uh, from district to district than any other plan, and significantly so. On our congressional plan, we also comply with the principle uh, which is to draw districts that are close as practicable to absolute equality. We miss absolute equality by a fraction of a percent. It's negligible, but it's well within the range of what is constitutionally permissible. On protecting uh, minority voting rights, we do better than any other plan. We create more majority minority districts, and we create more minority opportunity districts than any other plan. On the legislative side, we create nine majority minority districts on the House side and five on the Senate side. These are districts where 50% or more of the voting age population is of a, of a minority group. No other party created as many majority minority districts. We also created more minority opportunity districts than any other party. We created 24 on the House side, 10 on the Senate side, and two congressional minority opportunity districts. No other plan created as many. In terms of preserving and not dividing the reservation lands of federally recognized Indian tribes more than necessary to complete or to, to meet constitutional requirements, two highlights here. One, our Congressional District 8. I've already mentioned that. That's our northern district. It unites Minnesota's major American Indian reservation lands and trust lands better than any other party. We're proud of that configuration. No other plan does it, and we think it's appropriate and incredibly important. Uh, the other highlight is our House District 2B. Uh, House District 2B is in the Beltrami County, Bemidji area, and it unites Minnesota's three largest Ojibwe communities into one House District, creating the first opportunity House District for the Native American populations in all of Minnesota. The configuration is unique in order to pick up uh, and make that district an opportunity district for the American Indian populations who, who live there. Again, it demonstrates our priority, which was to preserve diverse communities of interest. And it reflects what uh, the Native American community and, and community leaders in this area have asked for in order to amplify their electoral influence. On political subdivisions, there's, there's apparently, I think, some, some 
misunderstanding between the parties. Um, we do split more political subdivisions total than any other party, but based on our, our uh, assessment of the maps and uh, the reports that come straight from Maptitude, you know, the, the, the software program that this panel ordered us to use, uh, we split fewer cities and townships than any other party. Um, and, and again, I can't explain where the differences come from here, um, but we, we took great efforts uh, to not split cities and, 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 and center our uh, approach on preserving people and communities, uh, which is a more defining um, kind of way people associate themselves than, than counties. We don't think county splits is the right way uh, to focus because in deciding where to live and sort of how they, um, how they define themselves, people don't pay as much attention to counties as they do to, to their local communities and to their cities and their townships. And therefore, we think cities should be the focus. Uh, to what extent do the parties split local communities? And if you look at it in that way, our plan fares, fares better than any other party. Um, local voting precincts, I, I, I just wanna highlight, local voting precincts are not political subdivisions. You know, those voting precincts must be drawn every 10 years to match the new uh, redistricting boundaries that are adopted by this panel or the legislature if it ultimately passes a bill. So those have to be redrawn by necessity. The panel need not and should not consider them in balancing the different plans. Um, on the consideration of um, incumbents and political parties and candidates, you know, we paid no attention to partisan political issues or where incumbents live, none whatsoever. Any allegation that we were motivated by those issues is just wrong. We've told you where we focused. We've been transparent about that in our briefs. We're transparent about it today. We balanced all the principles, but we focused on protecting the ability of minority communities uh, to elect candidates of their choice and are preserving those communities where they are based on the input that we gathered from them in a, in a very grassroots way. With the time that I have left, I wanna just highlight briefly uh, the some of the individuals who helped inform the development of our plan and some of the diverse communities that are at the center of our plan. Because we agree uh, with the Watson plaintiffs. We need to focus on what makes sense on the ground. But in order to know what makes sense on the ground, you gotta talk to pe the people who are on the ground. You can't just look at a map. You know, pe People are more than just data points on a map. Right? These are communities and we need to look at what binds them together. Where are they? You know, what are the interests that bind them together? So let me focus on some of the people uh, who helped influence us. Dr. Bruce Corey, who's here today. Uh, he's an immigrant professor of economics at Concordia University in St. Paul. His research for the last 25 years has focused on the ethnic, uh, the economic contributions of Minnesota's ethnic uh, communities. And his input and his scholarship informed various aspects of our plan. And he has affirmed through his declarations in this case, uh, the importance of preserving diverse communities of interest uh, within voting districts from a socioeconomic perspective. His research demonstrates that an ethnic economy of $100 million or more annually essentially creates a critical mass that will build on itself um, and foster greater uh, ethnic civic engagement by community members, which in turn will foster greater ethnic political participation and represent representation. And Dr. Corey has helped analyze our plan and he confirms that our plan creates 92 House districts and six, 66 Senate districts that would have an annual ethnic economy of $100 million or more within the district. And so that's another benefit of preserving diverse communities of interest in the way that we have. You, you, you preserve them from an ethnic economic base, which in turn will foster more civic engagement and political participation by members of those community, which will effectively foster a representative government that is more responsive to the needs and the interests of these communities. And so we thank Dr. Corey for his scholarship and his leadership on these issues. Lenny Finday. Mr. Finday is a member of the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe. He's also the general counsel of the White Earth Band of Ojibwe and the vice chair of his local school board. He's a leader and public servant within the Native American community uh, in the Bemidji area. And he informed and supports our configuration of House District 2B, which I described a little bit earlier. This House District was, is, is depicted in yellow on the top uh, map on, on the uh, slide there, and it unites the three largest American Indian reservations in Minnesota, the Red Lake Nation, the White Earth Nation, and the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe. 
Uh, House District 2B is one of our minority opportunity districts. It would be 44 and a half percent made up of Native American, of a Native American population. And Mr. Finday and other Native American community members who have uh, provided their input uh, to our effort have affirmed uh, that the tribes in this, there, there's many things that bind the tribes in this area together. They're the, they're the number one employer in this area. They operate eight casino resorts that are collectively the number one employer uh, for residents in this area, which binds them together on economic issues. They're also bound together on socio socioeconomic and policy, public policy issues like affordable housing shortages, physical and mental health problems, education and unemployment. Wally Deary. Mr. Deary is the executive director of the Islamic uh, Society of America, and he's a distinguished leader within the Somali community, uh, particularly in the Twin Cities area. And he informed our configuration of House District 60A uh, in the Cedar Riverside area of Minneapolis, uh, where we preserved a community of interest made up predominantly of East African residents. And 60A is depicted in the middle of this, uh, this map in green. Um, it is 47% uh, minority, so another one of our minority opportunity districts. Uh, and based on the input of Mr. Deary and other members of uh, the East African community there, uh, we, we, draw, we, we drew House District 60A in a way that tied together this, this community uh, of economically and culturally uh, similar folks uh, who share interests ranging from access to education, employment, healthcare, and other social services. Um, I wish I could highlight all the others, uh, <laughs> but I'm running out of time here, and I appreciate the panel's time. Um, I encourage the panel to look at the rest of our slides and the other individuals who helped inform our work and, and, and helped inform why we drew the district boundaries where we did. Thanks very much. Council, we will certainly review all of the written submissions that we've been reviewing um, as we go along today. Um, this brings us to our noon break. Uh, we will recess and reconvene at 1.30 uh, to continue then with responsive arguments from the parties.
you please be seated. We are back this afternoon to continue uh, the party's arguments with respect to their proposed redistricting plans. And our afternoon agenda will include 15 minute presentation from each of the parties proposing a redistricting plan, followed, I believe, by five minutes of uh, final rebuttal argument by each party. We will again go in the order in which the parties are listed on uh, the pleadings, beginning um, then with counsel for the Watson plaintiffs. Mr. Sinkowski. Thank you, Your Honors. So like I said, I'm just going to continue where I left off, and then I will have some, some other comments as well. But I just want to uh, continue to uh, continue our way down around the metro area. Can you turn this on? Oh, I see it. Oh, it says it's on. Okay, I am not very technologically savvy myself, so I just handed it to her. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so I'm going to jump to the northeast, uh, the north side of the Twin Cities uh, with the Northeast Metro, and this is the Watson Plaintiffs Northeast Metro. And I think uh, what I'd really like to point out here is the approach that we took was you can get pretty much all of North Ramsey County in two Senate districts and four House districts. Uh, like all the other parties, I think, or just about all the other parties, we paired Fridley with New Brighton. Um, but like I said, if you pair uh, White Bear Lake, Maplewood, North St. Paul, and some of those other communities, you can cleanly fit two Senate districts and four House districts in North St. Paul. And what this allows you to do is if you look at to the west or east in Washington County, we have a St. Croix River District, 48B, that spans from Stillwater down to Afton. And we pair that with, 40, um, with Lake Elmo and Oakdale in 48A. Now, um, that's the HIPPER panel. The HIPPER panel did have to go out a little bit into um, and collect some population from the outside of the Ramsey County area. But I think with the population growth that is currently taking place, I don't think that's necessary anymore. Um, this is the Sachs Plaintiffs Northeast Metro area, and this is a place where they um, achieved another opportunity, Minority Opportunity District, but to achieve that, if you look, they, they severed off part of north of St. Paul, took that with Oakdale, and then went down into uh, southern Maplewood. So they have this long, narrow district, and, what, and if you look, 39B has a voting age minority population of 31.2%. 41B is 30.4, so it kind of looks like they were just trading territory to get to a numerical benchmark. And I point that out because that's just not the approach that we took in, in drawing our uh, districts. Now, this is the Anderson Plaintiffs Northeast Metro. And as I describe this, I think this is kind of indicative of the approach that the Anderson Plaintiffs took and the Sachs Plaintiffs took. The Anderson Plaintiffs, uh, throughout their maps, took an approach of pairing uh, second tier suburbs like 41A with third tier suburbs on that border, 41B. They did it in the Northwest Metro. 
um, area, as we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, they did it with the Lake Minnetonka and the um, exurbs west of that. And the second tier suburbs are a partisan battleground. Uh, they are where the House and Senate are won and lost. And with the Anderson plaintiffs, you're going to see examples of them pairing second tier suburbs with exurbs, and you're going to see the Sachs plaintiffs pairing second tier suburbs with first tier suburbs because they want to pull those, that battleground territory into the more Democrat territory. And the Anderson plaintiffs, they want to do the opposite. So this is an example of pairing a house district with more exurban areas of Hugo and Grant. And then I also just want to point out the to achieve that end, they did have to make a district in Washington County that spans all the way to Taylor Falls and all the way down through Afton. And while the um, Hippert panel did have a very long and narrow um, St. Croix River district, it was not that long and narrow. It actually even got longer um, um, than it was initially. Um, this is the Cory Plaintiffs uh, Northeast Metro area. Uh, I guess the old, I want to point two things out here. Uh, they have four Senate districts along the St. Croix River, uh, 42, 42, 37, 36, and 17. Uh, you know, that seems to be dividing those communities. And they also, um, they pair their Southeast St. Paul district with Southern Maplewood, and then they cross the river to connect that with uh, District 67A, um, which is outside of St. Paul. Uh, and the, the Cory plaintiffs did leave St. Paul and Minneapolis quite a few times. Um, and, and like I said, you know, I, and I say this about the Cory plaintiffs, I, I think their intentions here are good, and I'm glad they have a, a voice at the table, but I also think that uh, we need to be realistic about the situation on the ground in, in crossing the river uh, out of St. Paul when we can neatly fit districts within those cities uh, just doesn't seem like a productive exercise. Uh, going on to the Northwest me Metro, uh, the Watson plaintiffs paired uh, Brooklyn Park and Brooklyn Center. And this is a great example of the Watson plaintiffs' approach. The Watson plaintiffs tried to, tier, tried to pair inner tier suburbs with inner tier suburbs, second tier suburbs with second tier suburbs, and exurbs or third tier suburbs together. That's the approach that we took because those people are experiencing growth in a similar way out of the mini, uh, the Twin Cities metropolitan area. They have a lot in common in terms of convenience, in terms of compactness, in terms of uh, minority, minority opportunity status. This, this approach um, complies with a lot of the panel's principles. And and, and the, like the pairing of Crystal, New Hope, Robbinsdale, North Golden Valley, and Brooklyn Center. Those all are go right around the city of Minneapolis, and they are very similar communities that belong together. Now, I look at the, the Anderson plaintiffs map, did keep, uh, oh, nearly keep Brooklyn Park whole, um, but they did take off a little portion of Southeast uh, Brooklyn Park and move it into Brooklyn Center. And, what that achieved was instead of having a deviation of negative uh, of 1.53 positive, now they have a deviation of negative 0.88, just under 1%. So the reality is, is while they have a deviation of under 1% um, in Brooklyn Park, they've split a political subdivision uh, to achieve that end. And we just feel that, you know, creating a map, uh, you know, attempting to satisfy certain numerical outcomes is not conducive and is not best for those people in, in Southeast Brooklyn Park. As, as you can see, this is just a map that we created showing that you can keep Brooklyn Park whole. This is just our map with the whole Brooklyn Park. Um, if the panel does decide it wants to keep it whole, and you can keep it whole with a 1.53% deviation and just making minimal de uh, changes to our map in uh, 35, 41, 39, and 38. Um, but we just wanted to put that out there just to show that Brooklyn Park can be kept whole um, and staying within the panel's population deviations. Uh, going to the Sachs plaintiffs, you know, so the Sachs plaintiffs have seven opportunity districts in uh, Northwest, in the North and Northwest Twin Cities. But to achieve that, they took Maple Grove and they, they put it in and they pulled some of the population out of Southern Brooklyn Park. And while that may achieve an opportunity district, what they've done is they've taken people from their community and they've pulled them so now that they are represented by someone who is not experiencing life like they are. They are gonna be represented by someone who's gonna be looking at the interests of the people of Maple Grove. And while this may ch achieve a numerical end, it doesn't make any sense on the ground. And what this also does is 
and consistent with the comments I just made about the, um, the Democrats want to pull, you know, send the second tier suburbs towards the first tier suburbs and the Republicans want to do the opposite, by pulling in Brooklyn Park, that Maple Grove District 52 now leans slightly Democrat. The Republicans paired that with the exurban areas and that district leans slightly Republican. So if, as you look around the map, around the Twin Cities, you're gonna see this theme between the Sachs and the Anderson plaintiffs. With the Sachs plaintiffs, they, they have these narrow districts down in Bloomington. And they do that because they wanna keep that, these parts of Burnsville and Egan, and they wanna keep them as close to the inner tier suburbs as they can, because that pairs the second tier with the first tier. And these are partisan decisions that were made by the parties that we didn't make. If you look at our maps, We pair the, you know, Brooklyn Park and Brooklyn Center, a logical pairing. We pair Crystal, New Hope, Robbinsdale, Golden Valley, St. Louis Park, a logical pairing. We keep Plymouth Hole. We do have to pull some of Maple Grove out to the west just for population um, requirements, but we, we don't engage in this give and take between the first, second, and third tier suburbs. Our approach was to create districts of suburbs that are receiving urban population growth in a similar way because they are experiencing life in a similar way. And I just want to make a comment about the Cory plaintiffs map here. I, I, the comment I want to make is I look at this and it had, it, you know, the concept seems to be there. Um, they, pay, they paired their 31A and 31B is exurban uh, growth, um, growth area. They paired Minnetonka and, uh, the, the, and the, the city of Minnetonka and the Lake Minnetonka district. Uh, they paired Plymouth and Southwest Maple Grove. They keep Brooklyn Park and Brooklyn Center. They keep Brook, uh, New Hope, Robbinsdale, those communities together. This is, this, this is a, these are pairings that make sense. I think the only difference between us is I felt like the Watson plaintiffs took a little more care in how they divided political subdivisions and how they um, tried to draw districts that uh, maybe didn't you know, go into cities uh, as much, but, or that didn't um, exchange populations among cities as much. And I guess I point this out too because it shows that the Cory plaintiffs are a grassroots organization. Their, their parties are, and so are the League of Women Voters. And you know, we were trying to draw maps that make sense on the ground. And I think the Cory plaintiffs were too, which is why you're gonna see some similar looking stuff as you look at our maps. There are differences, but there are some similarities as well. Uh, so, um, Again, just to, to finish up on the legislative plan, I just wanted to, to hit that, that idea of the, the exchange of the second, third tier suburbs, um, or just our approach of uniting first tier, second tier, and, and third tier suburbs because they are similar communities. Uh, now moving on to our congressional plan, I know we don't have a lot of time left. Um, someone at the first hearing asked me, one of the judges, you know, what's the most important thing to you in your redistricting principles? And my client said to me, if you are asked that question about your congressional plan, this is what I want you to say. I want you to say that we want to unite the Native American Indian population into one congressional district, and we don't want to split St. Cloud into three congressional districts. Now, going to the northern part of the state, the Native American reservations that we have included in our congressional district eight, that is not, um, agricultural territory. That is timber, that is, um, it, it's, 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 not this, it's not like the territory immediately to the east. So we're not dividing um, the agricultural industry by including these American, um, Native American communities with the rest within, in CD8. And we think our approach makes the most sense because while the, 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 what we have in CD8 is not agricultural, what we don't have in CD8 is. So we have found the, I guess what I would call the, um, the most logical place to split northern Minnesota. That is actually along the, the lines of the reservation, the lines where timber meets agricultural. So we don't need to make a whole northern congressional district. We can make a district that still creates that agricultural timber divide uh, while also uniting the reservations. Um, and, and, ju and just as I just have said repeatedly throughout our um, legislative plan, our approach to our congressional plan was the same. We want to create urban districts, and then we want to create districts around it that are receiving the growing population in a similar way. And that is why we believe that 
our CD6 makes sense. Um, the Cory plaintiffs and the Sachs plaintiffs take quite a bit of issue with it, but what their CD6 does is it combines sub second tier, third tier, and even fourth tier suburbs with very rural territory. While our CD6 might not be the most attractive thing in the world, um, the people in Forest Lake that are starting to receive population from the Twin Cities are having a very, are very similar to the people in Southern Scott County that are also receiving population in the same way. They, they have the same need for services to try to absorb this new population, whereas the people in, um, or the individuals in the CD6 that the Sachs and the Cory plaintiffs drew are in very rural territory and have very different needs and, and um, issues uh, that need to be addressed by their representatives. So while our CD6 may not um, look, um, look good, it makes sense on the ground, which is what we were trying to achieve with our congressional districts. And then just comparing our plan to the Anderson plan, I think, you know, we, we briefed kind of the issues quite a bit. But I think with our CD6, I think what we did that's different from them is we took it in more. We still included St. Cloud. And, and I'll say this too, the Twin Cities metropolitan area, the 11 county metro in St. Cloud, almost create exactly five congressional districts. So it makes sense to make a CD6 that includes the 11 county metro plus St. Cloud, because they are very similar in, in, in many different ways. So the Anderson plaintiffs kind of keep some of that rural territory in Stearns County. We eliminated that, and we put CD6 into Scott County, because while it required a county split, it created a community and a more convenient district of people that are experiencing the growth of the Minneapolis Twin City areas in a similar way. Um, and then I just, uh, just one more comment about the Sachs plan decision to include Anoka County uh, in their uh, CD8. Um, um, Anoka County and Grand Marais are two very different places. Um, and we just don't see the utility in, um, you know, representatives represent people, not territory. And we just feel like a pairing of Anoka um, with that very northern territory is not, um, is, doesn't make sense for the people there. Thank you. We'll have five minutes for rebuttal. Ms. Brahma, will you be presenting argument again? When you're ready, you may proceed. Thank you, may it please the court. Um, thanks for having us, giving us the opportunity this afternoon to walk through our plans in just a little bit more detail. Uh, once again, I'll start with the congressional districts and um, I, I think in, in that process also respond to some of the highlights of what we heard this morning. Oh, okay. <laughs> Starting with um, the, the congressional plans, I, I wanted to address this issue of communities of interest uh, globally for just a moment. Um, the Anderson plan paid, as we talked about this morning, very close attention to communities of interest in both congressional and legislative plans. I think where we struggle with some of the uh, discussions that we heard this morning from each of the parties was when they talk about communities of interest, they describe them in very subjective ways. Um, uh, we heard a lot in the last presentation about how the party or how uh, people experience life. Well, I might experience life the same or different as my sister or my husband or people who I'm very close with. And the, it requires a lot of different um, interpretations and acceptance of, of general generalizations as opposed to looking at where people live, how they organize themselves in political subdivisions, what industries, what areas they work in, what are their interests. And the other thing that I think we need to pay very close attention to when we talk about communities of interest is not just um, because this is redistricting and it's about enabling one person, one vote, not just how they will vote together if they live together and are placed in a district, but what access they will have to the polls. What, uh, how will um, elections be administered for the benefits of voters so that they can 
get to the polls and make good uh, choices from there. Because if they can't access the polls well, if there's not enough election officials to administer elections in small towns or in split counties, the little population with lots of geographic um, disbursement of population, then whatever vote they might offer, it doesn't matter anymore. So we need to make sure that we take into account both of those considerations. We've heard very little of that this morning, and that is why the Anderson plaintiffs focused so much on uh, political subdivisions, while, of course, uh, maintaining the other criteria as well. I'll note here some of the key differentiating factors of our congressional plans. As, uh, we, it's been noted this morning other parties um, drastically depart from the existing plan, and we talked about this morning why we do not. Um, but we also want to continue to emphasize that other parties dilute rural interests to an extensive degree, and that's something I think um, the uh, counsel for the Watson plaintiffs addressed just a few moments ago. It is important to recognize that rural Minnesota has very different interests, whether it's based on how people live in the sense of what their communities look like, whether it has to do with the, whether they're agricultural areas or what, what the industries might be, uh, what interests they are along the border of, of um, Minnesota versus along the Red River uh, versus in the timber countries to the north, uh, the northeast part of the, state, of the state. So we wanted to make sure that we are preserving those and not losing them by going so far south with the 7th, 8th uh, districts uh, into the metro area that we lose those characters. One of the considerations that we have here in the 1st District is Sachs and, and the Cory both split the 1st Congressional Districts into two, um, two parts, essentially. And in doing so, they created districts that are going to be very difficult to represent, which again means a loss of voice for the people who live there. I'm not saying that in the context of, of necessarily ease of the politicians, but you, a politician has to be able to, whether it's a Senate or House district or a congressional district, to be able to visit the people in the district. And by creating a, first, a split between the first and seventh districts, we have these very long districts in the case of the Sachs plaintiffs along the western border of the state, or in the case of the Corey plaintiffs along the northern border, and, and rejecting both the Zachman and Hippert panel's decisions that a, a district along the first, uh, along I-90 made more sense. The first congressional district of the Watson plan is a little bit more like uh, the Anderson plaintiffs plan but it, it ignores some key pieces, including testimony that Wabasha should be placed in the first district due to its connections and shared infrastructure with Rochester. And when we say that, we, again, I want to emphasize, we're talking about very specific interests. We're not just saying someone says, I feel more like I belong with this suburb than that suburb. That is not, not to discount that entirely, but it is very subjective and hard to measure when it comes to drawing districts. The Congressional District Plan drawn by the Watson uh, group also ignores a testimony that Northfield should remain in the 2nd District, um, in part because that district has two colleges, as we know, St. Olaf and Carleton, and there are strong connections to the southern suburbs in this district. Finally, the Watson Plan ignores some key uh, geographic or ge geologic, probably is a better term, uh, interest between Wabasha County uh, and the remainder of uh, the 1st District. Turning to the second congressional plan, here we saw some very strange uh, choices in terms of uh, how the Sachs plan puts together communities in the second district. The Sachs plan crosses the Minnesota River to pick up Richfield and Bloomington, and then puts them in a district that extends far to the south and all the way over to the St. Uh, Croix River Valley, including uh, cities like Hastings, Hampton, and other townships. Uh, and again, the Sachs plan divides the city and township of Northfield, which is um, unnecessary, frankly. The Watson plan, for the discussion about making sense on the ground, has this very strange tail on the northwestern uh, side of this district uh, that it, all it does is split the city of Chaska and, and uh, split Scott County. And so while there's discussion about not going too far into the, um, in, in, into either the too far to the uh, west or too far north, in order to get this district, the Watson plaintiffs make some choices that look questionable. Um, adding a little tail like that 
uh, is not uh, necessarily going to create a, um, confidence in, in the districts as drawn. And then the Cory plan uh, splits Eden Prairie from communities in the third districts where, where uh, Eden Prairie has resided for a long time. And again, we have sort of an unusual district configuration because in order to balance the population of the second district, uh, we have to move portions of suburban Scott and Dakota counties into what is otherwise a primarily rural first district. For the third congressional district, um, the Sachs plan moves first ring suburbs out of the fifth district into the third district. It's not clear why this is an appropriate thing uh, to do, particularly when there's plenty of opportunity for the fifth district to grow to grab some of these other uh, uh, first, ring, uh, first ring suburbs and keep them with the city. Um, moving rather quickly because 15 minutes goes so fast. Uh, the third congressional district in the Cory plan is a pretty dramatic deviation from the current map in that it moves a number of Ramsey County suburbs out of the fourth and fifth district into the third. Again, taking those inner ring suburbs and, and putting them with outer ring uh, suburbs. And one thing that I think is important to recognize about the Cory plan overall is that while the perspectives, I, I share uh, counsel for Watson's commentary that it's important to have those perspectives in this proceeding, there are broad interests that need to be taken into account here. And the Cory plan, in many respects, doesn't significantly improve minority representation in terms of creating significantly more minority, representation, uh, minority opportunity districts um, and, and otherwise reflecting um, other interests, frankly, in, in the state uh, that also need to be considered in the process of redistricting. The 6th Congressional District, uh, I think, in general, is, is one that um, Creates, I think it's created problems and, and challenges for panels uh, for years. And it's not because the 6th District itself is any particular problem. It's because the state of Minnesota with its urban core, suburbs, urban uh, exurbs, and then uh, St. Cloud in sort of the middle of the state creates challenges for any map that needs to be drawn. The Anderson plan succeeds in keeping the vast majority of St. Cloud whole in the, in the um, 6th District. Um, and and splits it along county lines because St. Cloud does reside in more than one county. And in doing so, creates a, a district that is similar to what we have today while recognizing population changes. And I think the, the one other thing that I, I would like to make sure that we, we note um, about the 6th Congressional District is the importance of keeping um, Carver County whole. That was something that we heard extensively in, in the uh, uh, public testimony, and I think it's important to know that other parties just failed to do that with some of their, um, their map drawing. And in particular, I went too far, the Watson plan uh, splits Carver County into four separate districts in their sixth congressional district. And in, in fact, carves off three Carver County residents in the seventh district. This, this is not the kind of attention to detail um, that we think is impro important for any uh, district drawing. At this point, with the time I have left, I want to make sure that we, we do talk about the legislative plans, and in particular, how they compare to each other. Um, where we start to, again, go back, going back to my comments at the beginning of this uh, 15 minutes, is that compliance with the panel's principles with statute and with constitutional law is required. And what we heard a lot this morning about elevating communities of interest uh, above statutory and, um, and constitutional requirements, essentially. Because much of the focus in practice was we looked at this community, we looked at that community, and we didn't mind if there was a split. We didn't, we, we list, we didn't mind um, how it affected uh, the, the management of that district or the, the access to voting. We just thought about keeping certain groups together based on what we understood those uh, groups to be. And we'd like to encourage the panel to obviously take into account communities of interest, but there will be a fair amount of weighing of evidence uh, and, and what information is available in order to uh, focus on communities of interest to the extent the other uh, parties advocated. As we said in our brief, there really isn't a, an exceptionally uh, big difference between the parties with respect to population deviation with the number of districts um, that are minority opportunity districts, 
all parties maintain um, contiguous uh, American Indian reservation boundaries to the extent possible. Splits are very different, uh, or not, not very uh, different in the terms of how many splits there are. And the districts proposed are largely compact, convenious, and con convenient and contiguous. But where we have some very, some very big differences within the legislative plans in particular is the Watson plan, we didn't hear a lot about it this morning, but we could see it in the, in the maps themselves, is the Watson plan focuses on preserving precincts at the expense of preserving political subdivisions and at the expense of other, uh, issue, other criteria of the panel. We know by law precincts will change when political subdivision or when the, the maps are redrawn. And so preserving precincts as sort of a proxy for communities of interest not only doesn't make sense necessarily, it's explicitly something that is going to change, unlike political subdivisions and other um, criteria before the panel. The Watson plan, therefore, divides 35% more counties and 69.8% more cities and towns than Anderson in House districts and similar uh, number of counties and 22% uh, more cities in Senate districts and unnecessarily splits townships, again, as we discussed this morning. Uh, and we also note that even though the panel didn't adopt criteria around partisanship indices and partisan competitive data, certainly that was clearly a focus for the Watson plaintiffs as well, judging by the extent of their briefing on this subject. The Cori plan similarly fails to comply with the panel's criteria and focuses, uh, as they say, on preserving communities of interest in a way that, again, requires the panel to consider communities as based on uh, a lot of focus on public testimony, which again is critical to the process but requires subjective determinations about how meaningful uh, what input is, what choices to make, whether it relates to voting or not to voting. And the current, uh, the change that we have seen over the last uh, decade, as indicated by the slides we showed this morning, we, we acknowledge and agree with the extent uh, to which minority uh, interests have grown in the state. And that was taken into account very much so in the Anderson plaintiffs' plans as well. It's just that where that growth has occurred does not necessitate the broad departure from past plans and from uh, maintaining political subdivision, subdivisions that the Cory plaintiffs uh, support in this proceeding. Finally, the Sachs plaintiffs um, also divide substantially more political subdivision, subdivisions than necessary, uh, as noted on this slide, and again, focus extensively on public testimony um, without providing any information for a lot of that testimony about who may have solicited it, how it got to be in front of the panel, what weight it really bears, uh, and, and how correct it may be. And one example of this is the, the uh, Parties taking Anderson plaintiffs to task a bit for the Moorhead District, which follows the Red River Valley. It is a river-based district. It is a district that's focused on the same district the Zachman panel drew 20 years ago. To claim that we should go west instead of south is a subjective determination. When we focus on the more objective criteria like political subdivision maintenance, population equality, um, and, and measurable minority statistics, the plans will come out much more fair and equitable at the end of the day. Thank you. Thank you. We will next hear from counsel for the sex plaintiffs. In my time this afternoon, I'll briefly touch on what we see as the key flaws of the other party's proposals and address some of the criticisms levied against our own congressional proposer. proposal. Mr. Zolt will then do the same for the state legislative districts. Well, there may be merits to certain discrete features of the other party's proposals. They all rest on what we see as a fundamentally unsound premise. They have not been drawn to adequately satisfy and balance all of the panel's adopted principles. Starting with the Anderson plaintiffs, the Anderson plaintiffs have repeatedly asserted that they are the party of least change. But while no one doubts that the panel should act in a deliberate 
fashion, a manacled lease change approach is not one of the panel's guiding principles. And things have changed. The basic configuration of these districts was drawn 20 years ago. This isn't a situation where there was a one-off impasse of the political branches and the court has to step in on a one-off basis. The panels have drawn the map for decades. And as decades go by, failing to make sensible changes to the map ultimately does not reflect a circumscribed approach. It starts to become an effort to put Minnesota's changing communities onto a Procrustean bed to torture them back into the shape of how things were 20 or 30 years ago. And that ultimately does a grave disservice to, for example, the communities of color who are responsible for all of Minnesota's population growth in recent years. That requires more than a seat at the table. That requires change to the map to reflect the changes that have occurred. For example, we'd submit that it no longer makes a lick of sense to have the first congressional district run all the way across the state just because that's how it used to be. A politician who can visit Pipestone can surely go just a little bit farther south and visit Rock County. And as the Sachs plaintiffs have demonstrated, it's entirely possible to make modest adjustments to the current map to draw districts that better reflect Minnesota's current human geography. The Anderson plaintiffs have also accused us of, in their briefing in particular of abandoning a 5-3 configuration in favor of a 2-4-2 map, but that's disingenuous, frankly. The, the enacted 6th district, like our proposed District 6, includes both areas in the 11 county metro and areas in greater Minnesota. The 8th district does the same. It already stretches from the Iron Range into the 11 county metro, Chisago and Asante in particular. The second includes Wabasha and Goodhue with Dakota in the 11 county metro again. We make only modest adjustments to the current districts, nothing dramatic or substantial, and certainly nothing that changes the fundamental characteristic of any existing district. Indeed, our changes better capture and sharpen the character of these districts as they have emerged over the years in their current configuration. The Watson plaintiffs, meanwhile, have premised clearly their congressional map on principles they advocated for earlier during this process, but which the court ultimately did not adopt. In particular, measuring things with partisan metrics, avoiding splitting current precincts, and maintaining the core of prior districts. Rather than adapt their proposal to the principles actually adopted by the panel, the Watson plaintiffs instead chose to double down on their preferred principles. First, the Watson plaintiffs prioritize maintaining current precinct boundaries. It's how they lead off their brief, advocating for their own congressional plan. It's clear this drove their decision making. Second, the Watson plaintiffs, really the primary thrust, is that the panel should adopt a plan based on making sensitive political determinations that are really outside the ambit of judicial redistricting. Ultimately, the last thing that the panel should do is wade into an ongoing philosophical debate about how partisan metrics, partisanship metrics should be used to construct districts. In its order establishing principles, the panel recognized that redistricting obviously has political consequences, but that it would avoid undue partisanship line drawing decisions simply by applying its own neutral principles. In short, it will draw lines based on what makes sense under those neutral principles. Accordingly, it rejected the Watson plaintiff's proposed partisanship redistricting criteria, but that's precisely what they asked the court to implement, to make line drawing decisions based not on its neutral criteria, but on the court's assessment of political outcomes. And this would require the court to wade into a political thicket. Should the map result in exactly the same partisan outcomes, even though the state's demographics are very different? What's the right way of measuring a competitive district? Is it eight, an 8% 8 cutoff or is it something different? They provide to the court a partisan index they describe on page 78 of their briefing that excludes certain elections. Is that a prudent decision to exclude those elections or not? So the court would have to determine what makes a competitive district. How do we decide some of these other questions? Exactly the sorts of political considerations that the panel is committed to avoiding. The Watson plaintiffs accuse us of engaging in partisan line drawing. The criticism is unwarranted, it's inaccurate, and it's difficult to understand if the panel reviews their own briefing. And in particular, if the panel looks at page 34 
of the Watson response brief. There's a chart using their preferred metrics, comparing the various plans to each other. And we've excerpted uh, that here. And what this shows is that across the various metrics that they use, and the, the ideal is zero, according to Watson plaintiffs, our plan is almost identical to theirs. And what it reflects is a pro-Republican bias. It's modestly less biased, so it's, it's closer to the ideal on the mean median metric. It's otherwise identical to the Watson plan. So this is not a partisan gerrymander. Um, that's simply wrong. The Anderson plaintiffs likewise accuse us of engaging in line drawing uh, that's based on partisanship. It's rebutted by the same data that's up on the screen here. But I'd also note that the Anderson plaintiff's objection rings particularly hollow, given that, as the Watson plaintiffs note, their own adjustments to the enacted map do seem grounded only in partisan considerations that are not based on any justification in the record. Our plan, by contrast, clearly responds to public testimony and satisfies the neutral redistricting criteria features that belie any allegation that our plan is motivated wholly or even primarily by partisan considerations, regardless of the political affiliations of the Sachs plaintiffs. This is not a partisan process, and we have not submitted a partisan map. A partisan map for the DFL would not have a 10% efficiency gap in favor of Republicans, again, just like the Watson plaintiffs' own proposal. Indeed, some of the specific line drawing decisions that the Anderson plaintiffs seize on, like the second district crossing the Minnesota River or the fourth district's inclusion of northern Washington County, address specific concerns that were raised during the public hearings. What was the point of public testimony if we are going to ignore it? We drew a plan that attempted to comply with public wishes, balance the court's criteria, and that's the basis on which this map was drawn. Thank you. Thank you. I embracing the principles that were adopted by this panel involves more than checking a box and moving on to the next principle. It involves making difficult choices. In elevating one principle over the other, as some of the parties have done, is itself a choice. And whenever they're faced with a tough decision about where to draw a boundary between districts, the thumb is already on the scale in favor of their preferred principle. I want to be clear, splits are unavoidable of political subdivisions, and the panel's principles are what must guide how those splits are made. St. Cloud provides an interesting example of this. The Sachs, Corey, and Watson parties all proposed splitting St. Cloud into two House districts and one Senate district. There's some differences amongst them. Uh, the Watson plan includes more rural areas pulled into that one Senate district, and the Cory plaintiffs unapologetically create a new minority opportunity district. Uh, but they do so at sacrificing some compactness and convenience. But it's clear what, what they are doing, and they're pursuing one of, these, one of the panel's principles, promoting minority voting opportunities in choosing to divide St. Cloud the way they did. The Anderson plaintiffs, Notwithstanding their emphasis on preserving political subdivisions, fracture St. Cloud into three House districts and two Senate districts. And this has the effect of diluting the minority vote. As you can see here on slide 13, the Anderson plan creates districts with significantly lower minority voting populations, looking particularly at the Senate districts, where Watson, Sachs, and Corey each create Senate districts that have one of the Senate districts creates a minority population of 25%, whereas Anderson's plan maxes out at 18. The panel, I need not remind you, was clear about the importance of protecting minority voting rights. This panel's principle not only prohibits the drawing of discriminatory districts, it requires that districts be drawn affirmatively to protect minority voting rights. I'm going to borrow a phrase uh, from Mr. Dillon uh, from his presentation this morning about a credible map. No credible map can live in the space between not discriminating 
against minorities and affirmatively protecting the minority voting rights. And that's a factor that needs to be considered when you reach one of these inevitable splits of a political subdivision. What is it doing in terms of promoting minority voting rights? There certainly, there certainly are no precise or mathematical methods to identify communities of interest. You can see, for example, the extraordinary work done by the Cory plaintiffs to identify minority communities across the state and the incredible work it took to do that, but it's still an imprecise and not mathematical method. And you can't simply look at political subdivisions, which the Anderson plaintiffs assert don't change. That may be true. Political subdivision boundaries rarely change, but their residents are constantly changing. And the plans that are adopted by this panel have to account for human geography, not just the political geography on the maps. So cities, counties, townships, they don't define communities of interest. The people that live in those communities do. And the so-called natural boundaries and roadways, uh, roadways and rivers, they similarly don't define the communities of interest. I want to know one thing too. If, if, if we're thinking about our own lives and the communities that we live in, and how do we define a community of interest? There's one, maybe not a political subdivision, but, but one line that's drawn on a map that I haven't heard anyone really refer to yet, and that's school district boundaries. And if you think about when people buy a home or, or choose where they're gonna rent or where they're gonna live, except for St. Paulites, who are unapologetically proud uh, to be from St. Paul, uh, people are looking at the, at the school district as a main factor in where they're choosing to live. That's what they identify with. That's where their kids are gonna to go to school. It's the team that they're gonna cheer for uh, on Friday nights when there's high school football games. And that is a, a community that ties people together. And if you wanna see how that can influence the drawing of political districts, look at what we have done in the South Metro with respect to Independent School District 196, which crosses Egan, Rosemount, Burnsville, or, or Egan, Rosemont, Apple Valley, and includes portions of Roseville. When it came time to try to make the difficult decisions about how to draw splits within those political subdivisions, we looked at the school district and tried to unify school districts together because that's how people identify themselves. We also turned to the public testimony, the people who came before this panel to have their voices heard and do our best to give effect to that. And if you want to see how that influenced our lines, you can look at our submissions to this panel, which detail how we relied upon that testimony in drawing our maps. And certainly, certainly be guided by the disenfranchised voices that were brought before this panel by the work of the Cory plaintiffs when you're making these decisions about where boundaries are to be drawn. The Watson and Cory plaintiffs propose what are essentially least change maps. Least change was not a principle adopted by this panel for good reason. A least change map elevates convenience and ease over fairness. And while it may balance the population across districts by tinkering around the edges of the existing districts, it ignores demographic trends in the evolving communities. Again, it, it focuses on the political geography of the state, lowercase p if that's the right p over the human geography of the state. And it essentially locks in maps, which due to changes in population and demographics over the last 10 years, now skew in favor of the Republican Party. And Mr. Stafford addressed this point, and I will only touch on it briefly. But when you look at the measures proposed by the Watson plaintiffs, in their opening brief, they say the ideal is zero. Look at pages 89 to 97 of their opening brief. Well. It turns out that the Sachs plan is closer to zero on nearly all of the measures. And now the Watson plaintiffs assert that the ideal happens to be whatever is between Anderson and Sachs, or in this case, their plan. But the proposed objective measures show that in fact, the Sachs plan is the closest to ideal on the partisan measures. Thank you. Thank you both. You will have an opportunity for rebuttal. And that brings us now to counsel for the Corey 
You may proceed when you're ready. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon, members of the panel. My name is Amy Erickson on behalf of the Cory plaintiffs. Sex plaintiffs have already touched on the approaches to redistricting briefly, so I will um, try to be concise here. But the Anderson plaintiffs and the Watson plaintiffs in particular um, have are too focused on lease change. And as a result of that focus, their plans are not responsive to Minnesota's population growth, um, fail to unite communities of interest, and otherwise fail to take into account the desires of Minnesotans in the communities in which they live. In contrast, the Cory Plaintiffs' Plan is responsive to Minnesota's population changes, does preserve, preserve communities of interest, and in doing so, adequately protects minority voting rights, while at the same time complying with the other redistricting principles. In regard to the population changes in Minnesota, I just want to address something that's been uh, said by the Anderson plaintiffs today. Uh, in particular, they have argued that population trends in Minnesota are stable and unchanged. That, however, is not true. Minneapolis and St. Paul metropolitan area in particular have been growing exponentially faster than rural areas. And as Mr. Dillon pointed out this morning, um, the result of that is that adjustments need to be made to the boundaries to move some of the growing metro area population outward. The Cory Plaintiffs' Plan adequately rec recognizes Minnesota's growing and diverse population centers, in particular in southeast Minnesota, central Minnesota, as well as the Twin Cities. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more specifically about Rochester and St. Cloud in particular later in the presentation. With respect to the redistricting principles that were adopted by this panel, uh, all parties uh, who have presented today to the panel have made decisions about how the, pr the principles should best be prioritized. The Cory plaintiffs have been transparent with this panel about our process of engaging communities of interest um, and our resulting maps which prioritize those communities uh, and attempt to also prioritize minority voting rights. Although the other parties excel on certain principles, they do so at the expense of others. The Anderson plaintiffs, for example, may preserve a significant number of political subdivisions, but they do so at the expense of communities of interest who don't fit squarely within the boundaries of those political subdivisions. Likewise, the Watson plaintiffs um, have prioritized some of their own stated principles at the expense of the panel's principles, re resulting in, um, um, excuse me, among other things, large population deviations, especially in their legislative plan. One other thing I just want to be clear about when we're talking about the principles is that communities of interest is not a subservient criteria to any of the other principles. In fact, in the panel's principles order, it was made clear that all of the principles, other than the compactness principle, were equal and needed to be balanced against one another. So despite the talk of prioritization, the panel did leave some flexibility for that, and, I, and, and we just want to emphasize that today. Touching a little bit on the principles that were relied on by some of the other parties, the Watson plaintiffs in particular have cited to some principles that were explicitly rejected, in fact, by the panel. Again, the panel's order says, if called upon to draw new districts, it will do so solely through the application of the panel's stated neutral redistricting principles. Despite this language, the Watson plaintiffs have defied the language in the order and relied on things like incumbent protection, ensuring political competitiveness, 
based on past election results, preserving precincts as political subdivisions, and also preserving the cores of districts. Likewise, the Anderson plaintiffs have also relied on data discussing incumbents and incumbent production, partisan data. And I want to address um, what the Anderson plaintiffs have referred to as the 5-3 the rule or, or this 5-3 split. Uh, with respect to the 5-3 rule, the Anderson plaintiffs have argued that both the Corey plaintiffs and the Sachs plaintiffs have improperly diverted from the Zachman panel's 5-3 congressional district model. So five urban, suburban, and or exurban districts, and then three greater Minnesota districts. Um, they've contended that because suburban, urban, exurban population split remains the same, the 5-3 model should prevail. They've also claimed that they attempt to preserve this split and avoid mixing greater Minnesota populations with those of the urban, suburban, exurban districts. Uh, preliminarily, the 5-3 rule uh, is not a principle. It, it, it was not adopted by the panel. The panel didn't provide direction to the parties on this point. Um, and we also, again, as I've mentioned, dispute the premise of stable population trends. There has been a material change in population distribution in Minnesota. People are moving away from rural areas and into urban suburban areas, which have become more concentrated. Um, I, I would also note that uh, you know we have maintained the the five three split to some extent, right? CDs two, three, four, and five are concentrated in the Twin Cities metro area, um, and all others are more concentrated in Greater Minnesota. Um, I think it's important to note, too, there's been a lot of talk about the 6th Congressional District today, and um, I would note that our 6th Congressional District actually isn't materially different than the current CD6. We've made only minor adjustments to those boundaries to account for those population changes. Uh, I'm going to skip over it just once. We've talked a lot about ideal population today. Um, with respect to minority voting rights, Mr. Dillon mentioned this this morning, but the Cory Plaintiff's legislative redistricting plan has created more majority minority districts than any other party's plans, and it has also created more opportunity districts than any other party's plans. Although the Sachs Plaintiffs have created 24 opportunity house districts, the Watson Plaintiffs created only 21, and the Anderson Plaintiffs only create 18. At the Senate level, the Corey and Watson plaintiffs' plans include 10 opportunity districts, while the Anderson and Sachs plaintiffs only create nine. The Anderson plaintiffs today have argued that all of the parties are substantially similar when it comes to minority voting rights. But as the panel can see from this chart um, and from the, the other testimony that's been offered today, this is not true. The Anderson plaintiffs have fared the worst when it comes to minority voting rights, especially at the House level. Um, in addition, they, have cl they claim to have satisfied the minority voting rights principle because they have created more minority voting opportunity districts than the Hippert panel did 10 years ago. This is not an appropriate standard. The panel has never indicated that the minority voting rights principle would be satisfied if a party simply drew more districts than the Hippert panel, and they shouldn't be able to satisfy the principle with that standard. It's more important for this panel to look at Minnesota's population trends and look at Minnesota's communities of interest and where minority, excuse me, majority minority districts or where opportunity districts can be created without violating the other principles, they should be created. And that's what the Cory plaintiffs have attempted to do with their redistricting plan. With respect to the Watson plaintiffs, I just want to note that the Watson plaintiffs have purported to protect minority voters through their redistricting plan. In reality, however, when you look at their plan on a micro level, the Watson plaintiffs have chosen to deplete certain minority populations from numerous districts that have previously elected minority candidates. By way of example, uh, Brooklyn Park and Brooklyn Center, the Watson plaintiffs dropped the minority population in their House District 39B, which previously elected a candidate of color, from 59% minority to 38% minority. But another way, what they have effectively done is turn what was once a majority minority district into what is now just an opportunity district.
With respect to American Indian reservations, the Cory Plaintiffs Plan is the only one that has centered the voices of American Indians in Minnesota. We spent time talking to American Indian leaders, and based on their input, we united the Red Lake Nation, White Earth Nation, and Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe into one congressional district. In addition, our plan splits less non-contiguous territory and less tribal lands than the other parties. I want to talk a little bit about convenient contiguous districts. Um, in the briefing, some of the parties have criticized a number of the Cory plaintiffs districts in particular for failing to be convenient or contiguous. And I should say, really, it's the convenience that, that all of our districts are, in fact, contiguous. With respect to House District 2B in particular, um, we've talked about this previously today. Um, <clears throat> The Sachs plaintiffs have argued that our House District 2B is inconvenient because of our choice to connect the three American Indian reservations by a single row of townships or a stretch of land that is the width of one precinct. Importantly, however, um, as we previously mentioned, our district was drawn this way at the specific request of the American Indians who reside in those reservations. Despite the potential slight inconvenience of having to travel from reservation to reservation, They've requested that it be drawn that way because it is more important to those communities that their voices be united and that they have the ability to elect candidates of their choice. I will also note that the Sachs Plaintiff's Legislative Plan also includes districts that are connected by a single precinct. Here are some examples. Um, and it's worth noting that the Hibbert Panels maps used a single precinct line in a similar fashion in what's currently House District 25B to connect Bell Plain to Northfield. With respect to House Districts 50A and 50B, um, House District 50A was drawn in a particular fashion to keep hold the Latino and Hispanic communities in the Shakopee area, Jack da Jackson Township, and Chaska, as was requested by local community leaders. And with respect to Senate District 20, <clears throat> You do have, although you have to cross the Minnesota River, which was the criticism of the Anderson plaintiffs, uh, it's worth noting that in the 12 short miles of river that, that is in that district, there are three different roads where you can drive across the river. 19 in Henderson, 169 in Minnesota, 93. The Anderson Plaintiff's Legislative Plan also includes districts that, in fact, are more difficult to traverse, more sprawling, and that cross the Minnesota River. And here are some examples. In particular, I'll note the Anderson Plaintiffs 20B, um, in contrast to plaintiffs, Cory Plaintiffs 50A and 50B would take over an hour to traverse, while the Cory Plaintiffs would take only 20 minutes. And as was mentioned previously today, some of the Anderson Plaintiffs districts also require crossing the Minnesota River. With respect to communities of interest, I think it's really important to emphasize that the Cory Plaintiffs Plan is the only plan that centers communities of interest. And on this point, the Anderson Plaintiffs and some of the other plaintiffs to various extents have been critical of the Cory Plaintiffs' emphasis on communities of interest. The Anderson Plaintiffs are most critical, arguing that communities of interest are impossible to discern. They also argue that they're too subjective. At the same time, however, the Anderson plaintiffs want us to recognize communities of interest such as rural communities in Minnesota. So on the one hand, they're criticizing the Cory plaintiffs. On the other hand, they're also asking this panel to recognize communities of interest. And as the Cory plaintiffs have unquestionably demonstrated, there is an abundance of available data on communities of interest. All, of the, all the Anderson plaintiffs had to do was ask Minnesotans impacted by redistricting um, and pay attention to their responses. In the last few minutes, I just want to highlight um, Central Minnesota and St. Cloud, which has been discussed a lot today. <laughs> because I think this is a good example of where the Cory plaintiffs have centered communities of interest and the other parties have gotten it wrong. With respect to the Anderson plaintiffs in particular, uh,
Their legislative plan fails to keep all of the populated areas of St. Cloud in, this, in the same Senate district. St. Cloud is one of the most racially diverse cities outside of the Twin Cities metro area, and the Cory plaintiffs engaged in extensive discussions with St. Cloud residents, and we determined that the consensus view was to keep the populated areas of the city in one Senate district and preserve the voting power of those minority communities in that area. <clears throat> On the congressional level, it's also worth noting that our sixth congressional district unites all of Saint, the St. Cloud Micropolitan Area, which includes St. Cloud, Sartell, and Sauk Rapids. In contrast, the Anderson plaintiffs split the St. Cloud Micropolitan Area between multiple congressional districts, uh, including splitting the city of St. Cloud between the 6th and 8th congressional district. Uh, again, the court, finally, the Cory Plaintiff's House Plan also keeps the St. Cloud's downtown core and the region's East African community in House District 14A, <clears throat> creating an opportunity district in St. Cloud. All the other maps have produced districts in this area with lower percentages of black residents. Thank you, Council. Thank you. We have now come to the part of the afternoon where everyone will have the last uh, five minute word um, in support or opposition to others' plans. And we will start again with Mr. Zinkowski. Thank you, Your Honors. Uh, I don't need my slides. Um, so I just want to take this last five minutes to just discuss a few issues. Uh, the first is the precinct splits. Uh, we've gotten a lot of, there's been a lot of discussion about that today. Uh, there are over uh, 2,000 political subdivisions in this state. There's over 4,000 precincts. Uh, precincts are drawn um, by local officials. They're nested in wards in cities. Uh, Minneapolis engages in a comprehensive outreach education and engagement strategy that is disseminated across the cities, that it, across the city that informs and involves residents. They are committed to implementing an authentic community engagement strategy, which includes cultivated cultural competency, inclusive meetings, and follow through. This is what Minneapolis does to create its wards. Their precincts are housed in those wards. Well, I don't understand why the parties are so resistant to using all this work that's been done on the ground by these communities to create these precincts. These are fantastic tools that this panel can use to draw its plans so that it can do so in a way that makes sense for these communities. And while we certainly uh, appreciate the Cory Plaintiff's outreach, um, they can't go to 2,000 cities and towns. They can't uh, account for 4,000 precincts the way the city of Elk River did that I showed earlier, and the way that Minneapolis did in drawing its Riverside community and its East and West Bank campuses. So we can use this as a tool. It's a, and it wasn't a principle adopted by the panel, but it goes to convenience, minority opportunity, it goes to compactness, it goes to numerous districts. So we just feel that let's use this as a tool to help us draw plans that make sense on the ground. Um, I noticed that the parties were using a lot of the evidence that we put in the record, specifically with respect to partisanship and some other issues in their um, presentations. Uh, the Watson plaintiffs and the Corey plaintiffs were the only parties that actually put any affidavit testimony in the record here. Uh, and I think that's important. Um, we don't even know who drew the maps created by the Sachs or the Anderson plaintiffs. Um, the Watson plaintiffs, um, while we put ourselves out there, we put our maps out there, uh, we described the effect of our maps on minority incumbents because we wanted people to know. We didn't draw maps to negatively affect them, but we want that information out there. And there's so much we don't know about everyone else's maps because they haven't provided information. And the parties are... Um, almost, they are criticizing us for providing information to the panel. This is an extremely important process. And, you know, there are two political parties that have intervened, and we do not think the panel should use partisan data to draw its maps. But the panel is certainly capable of using that data to determine if a party is complying with its, with its principle of not drawing districts with the purpose of um, promoting, protecting, or defeating a political party. So that's why we put that evidence in the record. And um, I, think it's, I think it's important for this panel to have as much information as it possibly can when it's making its decision to draw its plans. Um, finally, um, or my last uh, uh, two points, I want to talk about lease change. Um, 
the parties to this um, to this proceeding um, do not have the information available that is available to 200 and one House and Senate representatives in this state, representing every single corner and every single city and town in this state. We have limited and imperfect information. And while we've gone out and found out what we can, there's a reason that courts cannot draw plans making wholesale changes. Because while we may be benefiting a small community that we happen to be aware of, that has significant ramifications to others that we may not. With over 2,000 political subdivisions in this state, and over 4,000 voting precincts in this state, we just do not have the information available to be making wholesale changes at this point. And finally, I just want to, um, once again, just you know, hit, hit the point of what our approach was. Our approach was to create urbanized districts and unify first ring suburbs, unify second ring suburbs, and unify the exurbs in the Minnesota Twin Cities. We feel like this is the approach that made the most sense. Um, we feel that um, any, any attempt to combine first ring and third ring or second and third or second and first is uh, just an invitation to create to, um, not by the parties to manipulate uh, districts based on partisan, um, um, partisan preferences. So with that, uh, the Watson plaintiffs would just like to thank the panel for um, taking the opportunity to uh, listen to us today. And, um, um, and that is all we have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sienkowski. Ms. Brahma. Good afternoon again. I'm going to start this reply with where um, uh, Mr. Sinkowski left off, which is this issue of lease changes plans. The Anderson plaintiffs did not approach this map making, map making process with the idea of any kind of lease changes plan. In fact, it's not a term we've ever used, certainly not with respect to legislative districts, which change significantly, with small changes have ripple effects throughout the plan. What we did advocate for was a restrained approach because that is what the law requires of panels of judges drawing maps. And what we also did was look at the data to determine and the people and the communities. And so I wanna be clear, when we talk about data, that may sound cold and hard, that is not at all what we're saying. What we're saying is there's information that is measurable and objective about where people live. And we looked at that, we looked at population changes, we showed you the maps. We showed you the changes with respect to minority um, groups, both voting age and not voting age. And we drew congressional and legislative maps that met the panel's criteria that can be measured and can be seen as fair and, and representative maps for the state of Minnesota. What we've not heard from any other party today is what changes globally would require, particularly on the congressional maps, to just such a wholesale change. The arguments that the parties make about manufacturing, for example, versus healthcare interests in southern Minnesota, those are not new or different. And so to suggest that, that there should be changes based on considerations that have been taken in, into account by panels for decades, it really doesn't support the outcome that, that they are advocating for here. Um, I, I'd like to also address um, a, a couple of other items raised by the other parties. In particular, um, we appreciate that the Secretary of State looks at political subdivision splits the way we do, uh, which is that they are not just about boundaries of cities and, and, um, and counties. They're also about access to voting. They're about some being, um, as has been said by the Zachman panel, some of the most important communities of interest. And we ex repeatedly explained throughout our brief, and I, I didn't spend a lot of time going through every legislative district and what um, I, testimony we took into account and why we paired certain districts, but all of that is laid out in our briefs. And so we think it's important to be clear that our congressional and legislative districts focus on um, all of the panel's criteria and look at political subdivisions because it's a differentiating factor, because it's a statutory requirement, and because past panels have recognized that it's helpful to them to think about map making in terms of political subdivisions and, and avoiding those uh, splits. Um, we also uh, have to think in terms of the uh, 
some of, some of the particular arguments that were made recently. And one of those, for example, is um, related to the, the Sachs plaintiff's commentary about balancing of all of the different criteria. Of course, the panel will need to balance all the criteria. We're, that's what we're all trying to do here. There's no doubt about that. But the question is how to balance and how to make these determin determinations in a way that makes sense. And so when we look at some of the examples, um, every, every party has some odd districts. That's the state of Minnesota is going to lend itself to a few odd districts, whether they're uh, somewhat congressional or legislative in just terms of how they look. But the reasoning needs to be clear, and it needs to be defensible. If you look, for example, at the Sachs Plaintiff 6 Congressional District, which they talk about as, as being more compact. But what it really does is have a, a tail that brings Scott County into the same district as Benton Car and County and parts of Stearns County. Uh, it combines the primarily rural counties of Candy Ojai, Meeker, and McLeod with Scott Carver and Wright. This is just one example that, again, we put in our um, presentation in our briefs. There are other examples that I talked about this morning. And I think we want to make it clear that the balancing that this panel needs to do needs to take into account um, the, the objective criteria. I'd like to also address the Cory plaintiff's arguments about minority opportunity districts and how those are addressed. This, uh, the Anderson plaintiff's group, um, again, looked at the, this issue not only from an issue of putting of where groups exist, but how they can vote and how they can have access to the polls. And the Cory plaintiff's map for all their discussion at the end of the day doesn't create significantly more minority opportunity districts than any other party. And in fact, in doing so creates political subdivision splits that are significantly, significantly more than any of the other parties. Now their data is somewhat different, we don't know why, but we can look at their maps and we can see they split townships. And we know that maintaining townships for all the citizens of Minnesota who live in townships is critical to how they work, how they go to school, how they get services from their city, how they work with their legislators. So I think holistically, I know my time is up, we appreciate the panel's time and um, hope this provides a benefit to the panel to have all the different perspectives of the parties. Um, and and uh, thank you for listening to us and, and looking at our maps as well. Thank you, Ms. Brahma. up is someone, probably one speaker for the sex plaintiffs. You may proceed. Thank you, Your Honors. I want to start by addressing a question raised uh, by the Watson plaintiffs in their rebuttal. Uh, which is, why so resistant to the use of precincts? Why don't we simply draw upon the hard work that was done by local election officials across Minnesota? Quite simply, the precinct boundaries were drawn at least 10 years ago, and the human geography of the communities across the state has shifted. The precincts reflect the human geography in those precincts as they existed 10 years ago, not as they exist today. And we shouldn't tie ourselves if we're trying to draw a map that accounts for Minnesota and Minnesotans today based on old data. Also, I just want to note, manufacturing and healthcare, maybe it's not new. Mayo Clinic has been around for an awfully long time. But the prominence of manufacturing jobs and the healthcare industry, particularly if we look at the city of Rochester and surrounding communities, is growing. That is an appropriate factor to consider, even if it's not brand new. It is changing. It is having an increasing influence on those communities. I note that throughout their presentation, the Anderson plaintiffs refer to four, I guess I'll call them geographic regions in their presentation. Urban, suburban, exurban, and rural. But when they do so, they consistently list them in groups of three urban, rural, and suburban slash exurban. I don't believe that's inconsequential or accidental. This is how their plans are drawn. Suburban communities are consistently paired with their exurban or rural neighbors rather than grouping them together with their neighboring pure suburban districts or suburban communities to create communities that look like each other. 
There's a reason for that. Now, we heard the Watson plaintiffs assert that our maps have essentially the flip side of the coin. And they point to Brooklyn Park and Maple Grove as an example of that in House District 52B. They assert that this pairing was done for partisan purposes. It's not true. Brooklyn Park, the southeastern corner of Maple Grove, and Osseo are combined into House District 52B in order to keep together the Latinx community in that region. That's why it's done. There had to be a split of the political subdivision, and we turned to this panel's principles and the importance of protecting minority voting opportunities to determine how to draw that district. It's not a partisan purpose for drawing it that way. I want to close the same way that I opened the presentation, by reminding this panel that there is no perfect district. There is no perfect plan. I think that's a point, one of the few points, on which all the parties can agree. Every plan, particularly the legislative plans, because we have all combined between Senate and House districts, 201 districts to look at. Every plan has a district that if you look at it in isolation, looks a little bit funny. You saw examples posted on the screen today. You saw examples copied in briefs and referred to there. But you shouldn't consider those districts in isolation. As counsel for the Cory plaintiffs noted, I'm sorry, maybe I might be misascribing this. But you have to step back and look at the full picture. How were decisions made when the decisions were made to split political subdivisions or to pair communities together? What were the guiding principles? And which plan best embraces all of this panel's principles within those decisions? We just heard counsel for the Anderson plaintiffs refer to the data, that they had a data-driven approach. I'm a litigator. You're judges. I think of it as the record. And the record is everything that is in front of this panel the submissions of the parties, the census data, the testimony provided by the public. That is what needs to be looked at and evaluated when you step back and look at the big picture and try to determine which plan best embraces all the panel's principles, which draw fair, balanced maps for all of Minnesota. And when you do that, I respectfully submit that you will find that the SACS plaintiff, the SACS plans, promote those interests. And we respectfully request this panel adopt the SACS congressional and legislative plans. Thank you. Thank you, counsel. And finally, we will hear, it looks again from Ms. Erickson on behalf of the Corey plaintiffs. You may proceed when you're ready. Thank you. Redistricting is a process that's put in place to protect the voting power of the people. It is not a process put in place to serve local governments. To preserve political subdivisions over the communities of interest that reside in Minnesota would defy the fundamental principle of this redistricting process. Instead, the panel should elevate communities of interest which have been recognized by both this panel and the United, Supreme, United States Supreme Court as a valid and important redistricting principle that should be centered in this process. And in doing so, in recognizing communities of interest, this panel should not be afraid to deviate from past maps and to make changes that best reflect where Minnesota and Minnesota, Minnesotans are today. We appreciate the panel's time and their efforts in, in engaging in this redistricting process, in listening to community testimony, in listening to all of the parties here today. And we understand that you have a di difficult job of discerning and, and sorting through all of that information and coming up with a final map. The Cory plaintiffs respectfully request that you adopt our map, but to the extent this panel is going to examine portions of the party's maps and, and come up with their own map, um, we would ask that this panel take a close look at the opportunity districts, the majority minority districts that the Cory plaintiffs have created, and also to take a look at the communities of interest that we have identified across Minnesota. Minnesota. In particular, we ask you to take a look at our, our declarations and the slides that we presented to you today, and, and to understand 
that the voices of those Minnesotans are asking to be adequately represented in the, in the maps that are adopted by this panel. Thank you again for your time and your efforts. Thank you, Ms. Erickson. And I, and I want to thank everyone today for their helpful arguments. Um, this has been a process. And as the panel has repeatedly indicated, we know that the task of redistricting lies with our legislature and not a group of judges. And so we are and continue to be fully prepared to let the legislature do his work. And only in the event that they do not um, produce maps on February 15th, 2022, will this panel of judges um, issue maps. Uh, but I want to thank you for your arguments today. I want to thank the parties um, for all of the work they've put into providing the record, as council said, uh, to this panel, uh, among other items that are before the court. Um, but I appreciate the efforts that have been put in by all of you today. Um, we thank you for that. So that concludes our hearing on the uh, plan proposals. And so uh, we are adjourned. <laughs>